In this lecture, we are going to learn that how we can set up our uh, Windows operating system to run Ubuntu op operating system. Now, Ubuntu is a Linux-based distro, and uh, mostly developers and software engineers use Linux-based uh, environments uh, and uh, dist uh, distros uh, because it's really easier uh, to develop softwares uh, in Linux-based environment as compared to Windows itself. So mostly what people do is they just uh, uninstall their Windows operating system and, you know, install Linux operating system as a parent uh, OS for their laptops or computers. But I think it would be much easier if we, if, if we just, you know, installed Ubuntu uh, in our Windows operating system uh, using virtual machines. Now it really makes, uh, makes it easier for us to, you know, switch back and forth between Ubuntu and Windows at the same time because there will be some times when uh, you will prefer using windows and there will be some times when you will prefer using ubuntu uh, so it, uh, installing it in virtual machine really makes it easier for us to you know uh, operate on both of these operating systems together so let's just go to our screens now and see that how we can install ubuntu operating system on a windows operating system using virtual machines all you have to do is just go to the google and search for vmware file hippo another reason we why we are uh, preferring using file hippo is because if you download vmware workstation pro from uh, its official website then they require you to you know create a uh, an account on their uh, cloud services so just to prevent that uh, you can just go here and download it uh, don't worry it's completely safe from file hippo okay so just go to this very first link and click on it and it, it should take you to the web page from where you can download this VMware workstation. Just go ahead and click on this download free version and your downloading should pop up very soon. Uh, so what I have done is I have already downloaded uh, this software just to save uh, our time. Uh, so I will not download it. I will just uh, cancel it. But in your case, you will just go ahead and uh, hit this in start download if you have uh, IDM installed. Or if you don't have an IDM, then this pop-up will show up. And just go ahead and select the directory where you want to save this setup. And just click save. Uh, and it will start to get downloaded. I will just cancel it because I have already downloaded it. So the next thing that we need is Ubuntu I, uh, operating system itself. So we'll just go ahead on the Google. And we will search for Ubuntu ISO. So we'll click on this very first link. It will take you to the official website of Ubuntu uh, operating system. And uh, from there, you can download it uh, without any difficulty. And uh, just don't worry, uh, just li like Windows, you don't have to activate this operating system. It, it doesn't work like this. Uh, so when you will be downloading this operating system, it will be official with all the updates that in the future will come. So yeah. Uh, just go ahead and scroll down a little. Here you will find this Ubuntu 22.4.1 LDS, right? And whatever the uh, uh, version here is in your case, it really depends on when you're watching this video, right? So just go ahead and click on this download button. Again, your downloading uh, should start automatically and those uh, pop-ups will come up. But again, I will not download them because I have already done it. Uh, just to save our time right but uh in your case you will just let it uh, you know download uh and if it doesn't uh, you know uh start uh to get downloaded automatically all you have to do is uh just click here download download now button and your downloading will uh will, will be started now in my case this pop-up just came automatically so i'll just go ahead and cancel it because i just mentioned that I have already uh, downloaded this uh, operating system in my in my laptop. So I'll just go ahead and close this and I will again close this because I don't don't need any of those an anymore. I'll just open up my computer and in the D drive I have saved both of these files. This is VMware uh, that you will be downloading and this is the Ubuntu's uh, ISO file that you will be downloading, right? right? So let's just go ahead and first of all, uh, uh, try to install VMware. I'll just go ahead and double click on this setup and the installation wizard should come up uh, momentarily. Okay, so here you can see this uh, setup has is being processed. 
and it's it's really simple to install VMware in your uh, uh, Windows operating system. It's just like any other uh, app that you will install in your uh, Windows machine. And here you can see it's preparing to install. I'll just go ahead and click on next. I just I'll accept this license. I'll click next. Again next, 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 next all the way to the end and hit install. Again, it's gonna take a few seconds, few minutes. It really depends on the performance of your laptop or your computers. So I'll just fast forward this part uh, so we can save our time. Hey, you can see that our VMware has been installed uh, successfully. I'll just go ahead and hit this finish button, right? And after that, what we can do is simply just uh, go ahead and start it from our Windows menu. So just search for a, a workstation and uh, start from there. I'll just go ahead and remove this uh, because this was a previous virtual machine that I was working on. Uh, but uh, just for the sake of this video, I will create the virtual machine uh, from scratch. So what you have to do is just click here on this create virtual, new virtual machine. And uh, now just click, uh, just click on this option which says install a disk image file. Uh, in the brackets it says that ISO. Remember, uh, when we downloaded our Ubuntu operating system, uh, we downloaded ISO file. So that's why. Now just click on this browse button to locate where you saved your ISO file. So I'll just go ahead and click on it. And I will hit enter. And now here just enter your full name, uh, whatever username that you want to uh, give your virtual machine to and your password. So I'll just simply go ahead and I will write Muhammad Talha because that's my name. Uh, for username, let's say I'll just choose Marshmallow. Password, whatever password I will write here. And I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's your choice. I mean, well, you can write whatever you want here. Just go ahead and click next. Okay, now here uh, there are two things. First, what do you want to name your virtual machine? When you will create your virtual machine, then here, here where my cursor is right now, uh, your virtual machine will be listed here with that name. So just write whatever name that you want. And from here you uh, will select the directory where you want to save your virtual machine. So what I have done, I have uh, created a, a separate drive just for this virtual machine and it's almost 50 GB. So I'll just select that and click OK. Now uh, the virtual machine that will be created, it will be saved in my this separate drive and I would hi highly recommend you to do the same. Just create a separate small drive for virtual machine and then save your virtual machines there. I'll just go ahead and click next uh, because I uh, mean uh, use uh, separate drive for of 50 GB so I'll just give 50 GB to my virtual machine. And I'll just go ahead and click on this option. Uh, so all of your files, all of your, whatever uh, the configuration that this virtual machine will make and they will be saved in, in a single file. Click next and here you can customize your uh, features, right? So I have eight GB of RAM in my laptop, right? So what, what, what I want to do is just give uh, this much RAM 3568 MBs of RAM to my virtual machine. So I'll just click that. You can increase or decrease uh, according to your requirements. Uh, my laptop has four cores, so I will give two cores to the virtual machine. So yeah, let's just go ahead and close this and then hit finish. And just like that, your virtual machine has been installed uh, and uh, has been created, right? But wait, we yet uh, have to install Ubuntu operating system in this virtual machine. At this point, we only have uh, created a virtual machine. But now uh, we will create our uh, uh, Ubuntu in, inside that virtual machine. So let's just go ahead and hit OK. So we, of course, it's, it's going to take uh, some time to configure things. Uh, and let's just go ahead and maximize this so you, we can see the screen clearly. I'll just close this and I will uh, go to the full screen. And here you can see uh, 
uh, you can uh, see your Ubuntu system on oh, full screen here. So your Ubuntu is uh, starting to uh, get processed. This is the uh, this is almost like a welcome uh, window or, or welcome page, like when you log into your Windows operating system, right? So it's just like that. Okay, so here you can see that uh, your wizard for installing Ubuntu uh, has been started. Just go ahead and select whatever language that you will prefer. In my case, I will prefer English and US. And I'll just uh, click continue. Leave these options just like this. You don't have to change them. Click continue. And uh, now from now on each step, it will take a couple of minutes maybe a couple of seconds just to configure things right so uh, i'll keep uh, skipping the waiting part just to make this video shorter okay moving on to this next step uh, here you can see we have uh, these two options that it is this can install ubuntu and we have something else you don't have to do anything else just go ahead and click on install now Okay, so uh, here it will create multiple partitions based on uh, its own requirements. And the reason why I uh, created a separate uh, drive in my Windows operating system because I did not want this uh, virtual machine to mess with my uh, parent operating system, which was Windows, right? So this way you can prevent uh, any confusion. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it might be possible that at this step, when uh, if you haven't created a separate uh, uh, drive or separate space or separate directory for this operating system that it may also uh, remove some files from your Windows operating system that that can cause that operating system to crash, right? So just to uh, keep things simple, I created that drive and I highly recommend that you do the same. So, uh, I mean, at this stage, uh, if you're confused what that is, you don't have to worry about it. Just go ahead and hit continue. And now it will, uh, you know, begin to install uh, your Ubuntu system in that drive that you selected while creating the virtual machine, right? So uh, I'll just, uh, you know, make it fast forward to save our time. And then we'll uh, see that what uh, we have to do next after installing, after this installation has been completed. Okay, uh, at this uh, step, you will have to uh, select your location because uh, according to that your time zone your uh, update schedule everything will be decided right so uh, what you can do is just uh, select your uh, city or your capital or your, whatever location you are right here you are in right now so in my case i am in Islamabad, pakistan so i'll just go ahead and uh, type that now let's just go ahead and hit continue and again your rest of the uh, progress uh, will be continued here you will just write your name uh, whatever you want to write here uh, this name will come up when you will try to log in in your Ubuntu operating system you can change your computer's name marshmallow you can write it whatever you want it's really uh, optional or uh, you know uh, it's not a, a very definite thing you can you can write whatever you want pick a username uh, marshmallow and then your password right so whatever password that you will feel is good for you and then hit continue and your uh, rest of the installation or your configuration for your operating system uh, will be continued just like that So as you can see that uh, Ubuntu has been installed successfully and uh, our VMware is asking us to uh, restart the system just to, you know, configure things. So let's just click on this restart now and wait for Ubuntu to, uh, to be loaded again.
Okay, so as you can see that our Ubuntu has been loaded. Now all you have to do is just log in to your operating system, click on it and uh, write the password. Remember when uh, the password which you set during the installation of Ubuntu, that password you have to uh, enter here. So let's just go ahead and hit enter and uh, you will be logged into your Ubuntu operating system. Okay, so this is, we have this uh, Ubuntu installed in our uh, Windows machine with the help of uh, VMware. Uh, so let's just quit this, I'll close this. Okay, so here you can see uh, we have the, the display of this uh, machine is very small. I mean, you cannot do anything uh, with this display, right? So all you have to do is just hit your Windows button and type for settings, right? Go to settings and here search for display, right? So uh, here uh, just click on the resolution and select uh, the appropriate resolution that uh, that will be good for your screen. Uh, my laptop supports uh, HD, so I'll just go ahead and uh, select this one, 1920 by uh, 1080p so I'll just apply this and you can see that uh, now Ubuntu uh, the display of this operating system uh, is scaled to my uh, to, to the display of my laptop right so that's how you can uh, deal with this uh, with this display uh, problem as well so now you have uh, installed your Ubuntu in your uh, uh, Windows machine with the help of uh, VMware in the coming lectures, we will uh, get familiar with Ubuntu itself and how we can use it uh, to perform different tasks. In the previous lecture, we learned that how uh, we can download and install VMware Workstation to create virtual machine on our Windows operating system. And after that, we learned that how we can install Ubuntu uh, in that virtual machine. And we know that Ubuntu is a Linux-based distro uh, which we will be using in this course. So in this lecture and in coming few lectures, we will be uh, working with some uh, tweaks and some settings that we can use to optimize the performance of our Ubuntu before we just go full on uh, with day-to-day -day tasks. In these lectures, we will get familiarized with Ubuntu, its layout, uh, how can we optimize it, and how can we make our lives easier. So the very first thing that you need to do after installing your fresh Ubuntu operating system is uh, try to update uh, this operating system and upgrade all the packages that have uh, upgrades available. So for that, uh, just open up your terminal and remember that when you'll be using Ubuntu operating system, this terminal is going to be your biggest friend because most of the time you will be working with uh, this terminal. Now, first of all, let's just understand that how uh, this command for installing something actually works. And then after that, we will uh, use this command to update uh, our system and upgrade all the packages as well. So for example, let's take an example of installing VLC. This is just for the sake of an example, right? Uh, let's uh, consider that we want to install VLC. So for that, all you have to do is type sudo apt install VLC. Now, most of the time when you, you will be installing different packages or different softwares, you will be using this command, right? So let's just understand that what this command actually is. So first of all, we have this word which says sudo, uh, which actually means su uh, and this SU uh, shows that you are a super user. So S is for super and U is for user. Remember when you will be changing something in your Ubuntu, like installing something, removing something, updating or upgrading something, you have to do it as a super user, right? So uh, for that reason, uh, before you wrote this command, okay, I want to install VLC, you told your terminal that I'm doing it as a super user, right? Next comes apt. So this is a package that comes built in in your uh, Ubuntu operating system that is used to download and install packages. And next we have a keyword install. 
in the case of installing something if you want to remove something then this uh, word will be replaced by remove so the command will become sudo apt remove vlc or in the case of update you will just write update right and after that uh, the package name or the software name that you want to install in your Ubuntu. Now, when you will execute this program, uh, this terminal, you are actually telling this terminal that I'm doing this task as a super user, right? So, when you will enter this command, this terminal will ask you to verify that if you are actually a super user or not. And it will ask you the password that you use to log in into your Ubuntu operating system, right? And after you enter that uh, password, the, after that, it will install uh, any package that you want, right? Right now, we don't want to install VLC. Uh, we want to update our system. So all you have to do is just type sudo apt update and it will update everything in your operating system. Uh, so the very first thing that you need to do uh, after installing Ubuntu is update it. And here you can see that it's asking me for the password to verify that if I'm actually a super user or not. I'll just enter my password and here we go. Uh, the update is being done and it really depends on your internet connection uh, that how long it takes. Okay, I'll just maximize this to uh, show you what this actually means. First of all, you have to know that this is just a warning. It's not an error, right? So uh, it's showing me this warning because I changed uh, this sources list many times. Now what uh, this sources list actually is, it contains all the links uh, of the mirrors of Ubuntu from uh, where it downloads all the packages, right? So somewhere on the internet, we have some links, some servers where all the packages that we are going to be needing in Ubuntu, they are living there, right? And those links uh, are given in our uh, sources list in our operating system. Now, sometimes uh, some of those uh, links don't work at all. So what you do is just try to uh, find uh, live uh, mirror links and you replace them with those new links, right? So that's what uh, it really is. It's telling me that I have changed my sources list many times. It's just a warning. Uh, if you just go above, it has updated everything. There's nothing to be worried about. There is no error. This is not an error. In your case, it might not even show, right? It's just showing me in my case. Now, after update, it's telling me that seven packages can be upgraded, right? That means uh, we have newer versions of uh, those seven packages. So to upgrade it, I'll just go ahead and clear this prompt. So we have a clear screen. All I have to do is just write sudo apt before I did update, now I want to do upgrade. So it will upgrade all the packages that have uh, new versions available. Again, I'll just hit enter and it's, uh, it's to it, oh, okay. So uh, it's actually showing me that uh, there's nothing uh, to be upgraded uh, because there was nothing to be upgraded. It, has, it hasn't installed anything new and it, it hasn't removed anything. Okay, well, the reason why it's, it's showing that it's it hasn't removed anything because sometimes there is a version of package when the new version comes, they stop the support for the previous version. Now, in that case, your new version will replace the previous ver ver version. And to do that, your uh, system will uh, first remove that previous package and then it will install the next one, right? So uh, that's why it, it's showing with this error, right? So, uh, okay, so uh, for it, it, it didn't take me uh, longer to do this because I recently upgraded my system. But in your case, of course, it, it will be downloading a couple of uh, packages that needs to be upgraded, right? Uh, so yeah, that's it. That's how you can upgrade your system uh, or your Ubuntu operation using terminal. And next thing that you could do is just, uh, you know, press Windows button on your operating system and type settings. And in those settings, okay, actually, you don't even have to go to settings. You can just type updates there. Just type updates and click here, software and update. I will see that uh, when this command will open up, uh, I'll just close this settings because I don't need it. We can directly go to the updates. 
Okay, so here we have this software and updates prompt. Uh, just go to this tab, uh, set the time. You can set the time uh, that after how much time your system will have automatically uh, updates installed in it, right? There are different boards. You can uh, display uh, that uh, the updates that needs to be uh, downloaded. You can only download them automatically and do not install them or you could uh, download and install them automatically so it's uh, i mean it's a be best practice to uh, you know select this option right here okay so uh, and here you can just you know uh, mention that which type of updates you are looking for so it's recommended that you select all updates here because sometimes they don't only send you security updates but they also send you your system uh, updates like I mean, uh, it could be re related to display, it could be related to performance or speed or something. So in that case, we don't want to miss them, right? So all you have to do is just click on this all updates button. Okay. Uh, and the next thing you should do is install your drivers. Just come here on additional drivers tab and just wait for a little longer to uh, let it a test for all the drivers that you need and after that it will give you a list of drivers which in my case uh, yeah it's not giving me any because my system is up to date right now but in your case it will give you a list you will just click on that uh, a list or for an item to select and here uh, apply changes will get enabled uh, so your Ubuntu system will download and install that driver automatically. You don't have to go to the internet and search for them individually, right? So it, it's pretty easier to use Ubuntu as compared to your Windows operating system. Uh, even when you'll be working with uh, creating softwares, writing scripts, you, you'll see that Ubuntu is very much easier to use. You don't have to install uh, any new package, any, uh, you know, required like like you have to install dot and dot net framework you have to install uh you know java related uh softwares to sub in windows to support uh that programming language you don't have to do anything at all in ubuntu uh it's really really convenient for developers that's the reason and most of the research most of the new tools most of the new packages uh, they are being built and they are available for ubuntu most of them are not available or do not work on Windows. So that's why uh, it's a really great practice to learn Ubuntu or any other Linux based environment because that will help you in building up uh, your career, in especially in IT domain. So I'll just close this. So in this lecture, you learned that how you can update and how you can upgrade your system and how you can install and set up uh, your update schedule and how you can install your uh, additional drivers that you, your computer or your laptop may need, right? So in the coming lecture, we will uh, learn that how we can set up the appearance of your Ubuntu, how we can change the colors theme, how we can change the display resolution, etc. In this lecture, we will be get familiarized with the layout of Ubuntu. We will uh, set up the display, the appearance, uh, and everything and we'll see that how we can customize all of that according to our desires uh, so it's just an opportunity uh, to use Ubuntu and you know uh, see that how friendly everything is uh, even though it's a Linux uh, based environment and mostly it's a perception that all you have to do is just use commands and do complicated stuff uh, to, to, to do even a very simple task but that's not actually true uh, in this lecture, we will set up our uh, system, we will customize its theme, we will customize its colors or display or resolution and I'll show you that how you can do all of that. So all you have to do is just uh, hit your Windows button on your keyboard and type settings and it will take you to the settings of your Ubuntu operating system. And just go here on this search bar and type for uh, display or your appearance or uh, you can also find it on the left side on this uh, scroll menu. So just click on this appearance tab and this menu will come up. I'll just uh, take this dialog box here. Okay, so first of all, we have style and in style we have uh, light and dark uh, theme. So in Ubuntu, 
uh, light and dark theme comes built in right so here you can see all of this menu is wide if you will open up uh, open up uh, anything in the in your open to everything will be wide right so uh, this is a light theme but if you want you can also switch to dark theme and it's just like this click on you click here and everything will uh, you know just go black uh, dark and it's really uh, a great look actually especially when uh, you're working uh, during the night times so it will help you protect your eyes so here you can see we have this uh, black and orange uh, or yeah orange uh, contrast with it uh, if you don't want this you can simply just go ahead and you know change the color uh, just click here and everything uh, will be changed right so you can just click here uh, I mean, this is a green color, and you can see these folder shades, they also get changed, right? And uh, these menus or these buttons, they also get changed. Let's say, I mean, uh, you select this. and So that's, that's how simple it is. I mean, you can just simply select light or dark, and with, with that, what controls you want on the buttons or on the icons, you can simply just uh, select uh, the one of these 10 different choices right so uh, let's just you know uh, go with this screen for a minute right and let's switch to this dark theme because that that looks much more cooler coming up next we have de desktop icons right so uh, first of all we have size just click here on this drop down menu we have uh, four uh, different options just look here on the left hand side if i just click here normal you see these uh, icons just got bigger uh, large they will get even more bigger and then we have tiny they will become very very small right so that's how you can change their size according to your desires or your uh, display uh, screen size right so in my case i will just stick to small because that's enough for me uh, and whenever you uh, download something on your desktop or create a new file uh, it's you can select uh, where you want it to show right so first of all if i just go ahead and let's say i create a text file right uh, i just write this is a test file and if i just save it on my desktop with test uh, let's see where, where it comes so here you can see on the uh, right bottom uh, it came right so because i have selected this if you want it to appear like here on uh, on top left or or your left bottom or your uh, top right you just go ahead and select one of these options right uh okay so uh, next we have this personal folder uh here you can see when you switch it off this home button uh, you know uh, got disappeared so if you want this uh, folder and just go ahead and switch this uh, then comes dock right if you just go ahead and uh, enable this you can see all the folders went behind this dock right so uh, you, you can even select them uh, but i would highly suggest you to you know uh, switch this off so you get these icons uh, beside your dock this is dock where you have all these icons this is called dock uh, in in uh, windows you call this a taskbar right uh, which comes at the bottom here so just uh, disable this auto hide dock because uh, i mean so your uh, these icons they do not come behind it or you know they get visible to you uh, you can also switch uh, this dock to panel. Uh, I mean, right now it's in panel mode. If you just uh, switch it off, you can see it, it got disconnected, right? So it, it really, uh, it's up to you that how you like it. Uh, I like it as uh, in, in panel mode, so I'll just uh, switch it on back. Now, if you want to change this icon size in this dock, you can simply just use this slide bar. If you just go on the left, the, the size of the icons will start to get smaller and if you go on the right the size will get larger right so i think uh yeah this should be fine if you want uh, i mean for example you have connected multiple displays multiple lcds to your computer or your laptop right so if you want to show this dog on another screen on your second display then just click here 
and select one of the displays that uh, come here, right? Right now, I do not have any uh, any other display connected, so it's telling me unknown. But if you have any LCD connected or LED uh, connected to it, then it will list all the displays available here. Right? Just go ahead and select one of these, and this dock will be shifted from this screen to that screen. Right? Uh, where you want this dock to be right now, it's on left. If you want it on bottom, let's say, then it will just go to this bottom area, just like in Windows. Uh, uh, or if you want it on the right hand side then it will just go to the right hand side right so I think it looks good on left hand side for me so I'll just you know uh, uh, stick to this uh, then comes our uh, uh, configure dock behavior uh, you can I mean if you just switch it off then the trash this is the trash rubbish bin uh, which in Windows we call recycle bin right so uh, if you want to enable it you can just enable it if you want uh, to show these devices you can simply just open it and close it right so these are the unmounted devices volumes volume means devices right so cd-rom your uh, usb your floppy and etc so if you want it uh, just you can sh you can display them here if you don't just you will you can just switch it back off so i just switch it off because i do not need them right so yeah, that's how you can uh, play with your uh, appearance uh, when it comes to what do. Let's say you want to change your resolution, so you can simply just type in display and go to screen display. Okay, so first of all, here we have, uh, I mean, different type of orientations. This is a landscape where we have a greater width and smaller uh, height, right? If you want to change it to the, uh, I mean, flipped landscape uh, then you can just simply select and apply it and it will be flipped on 180 degrees i will not do that because that won't look uh, much good okay this is the resolution part so imagine your laptop uh, i mean supports let's say it supports 4k display uh, or it supports 720p display or it, or it supports uh, 2K display, then you can just simply go ahead and select one of these options which is suitable according to your display, right? In my case, uh, because my laptop uh, supports HD display, which in other words is 1080p, so that's why I have selected this option here, right? So, uh, I mean, if let's say if I just go ahead and select this option, and if I just apply it, so you can say we uh, see we have uh, now we have these uh, scroll bars right because the dimension of the screen has been changed uh, and that's not good i mean i do not uh, want to keep scrolling my display i i just want to work uh, without any uh, any hurdle so that's why i will not uh, select that and the most compatible resolution for my display is 1080p so that's why i am selecting this right so this is a refresh rate uh, mostly it will be auto selected when you will select the resolution uh, this is a 60 hertz because that's what 1080p supports uh, yeah so that that's uh, pretty much uh, what you can do with your display resolution right so now you can uh, you know that how you can uh, configure your display or your appearance uh, in ubuntu Right, so if you just go ahead and open up any folder now any every folder the background will be uh you know uh, will be dark because you have selected dark theme and because we chose green color so every folder have this green shade right? and even if you select them it will be green right so that's how you can change the colors according to your needs yeah in this lecture we learned that how we can customize the display and color theme and appearance of your ubuntu operating system Okay, uh, so now that we are comfortable with Ubuntu operating system and now we know that how we can install it, how we can uh, work uh, with a couple of different customizations like changing the themes, colors uh, and other layout uh, settings, uh, it's time that we move ahead and uh, try to dive into more technical things. So in this lecture, we are going to be uh, working with Snap installation package that comes in uh, Ubuntu operating system. So for example, if you just go ahead and try to open up your Firefox via web browser, 
So uh, hey, you can see that it's taking a lot of time to load up, right? Uh, so that's uh, actually because of snap installation or package manager. Uh, because whenever you install something, it tries to build up a lot of cache and build up uh, other uh, applications at the back end. Uh, and because of that, it just, uh, you know, takes uh, so much time to load things. Uh, but uh, there are way, there's a way that we can avoid it. Uh, and uh, the way is that we will uninstall uh, this Firefox from Snap and we will install it again without a Snap. There are other uh, options available as well. Uh, I mean, to avoid using Snap uh, Package Manager and one of them is called Flatpak and uh, we may see that uh, how we can work with it. But in this lecture, we will just simply go ahead and uh, reinstall this Mozilla Firefox web browser and it will uh, help us to demonstrate that how you can uh, uninstall a certain app uh, and reinstall it uh, without snap right so uh, I mean if you in the future if you want to uh, remove something you can do it uh, like this so uh, what will actually happen is uh, here you can see that it took a lot of time to load this Mozilla Firefox, right? So we'll just simply go ahead and close this and I'll, uh, you know, I'll open up this text file that I've created and it contains all the uh, commands that I need uh, to uninstall the Firefox first and then reinstall it without snap. So uh, uh, let me let me just quickly show you that what I mean by snap I've, if I'll just go ahead uh, here and let's say I will type software uh, and I'll go here to Ubuntu softwares uh, so here let's see if I just go ahead and click on this package that, that I want to install uh, of course it's gonna take some time uh, here you can see uh, it's telling me that this Postman software is offered by Snap Store, right? So it's it's really a secure thing. It's a very good package manager, but sometimes it takes a lot of uh, you know time to load up things. So if you want to avoid that, just follow these steps. So we'll just open up our terminal here, and we'll just copy paste these commands. I will. Uh, move my terminal here so you can all see all these commands. I'll just copy this command from here and uh, I'll paste it here. Uh, and by the way, you can get all these commands from this article right here. Just go to this article and uh, the writer has described everything in detail. So don't worry about this. Just go ahead and use your Snap Package Manager. Remember before we were using Apt Package Manager, right? But now we're using Snap because this Firefox has been installed uh, using Snap. So I'll just go ahead and run this. Uh, of course, I'm doing this uh, as a super user privileges. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and enter the password to verify that I am a super user. Uh, and after that, it'll just disconnect everything, all the packages, all the dependencies uh, that the Firefox is using. Uh, and after disconnecting them, it will just uninstall it. So of course it's gonna take some time. So what I'll do, I'll just fast forward the video uh, to I mean end of the processing that it's doing, and then after that we'll just go ahead and perform the rest of the uh, rest of the steps that we need to uh, reinstall and configure our Firefox. Okay, so now you can see that uh, Firefox has been uh, removed from our laptop and here on the left hand side you can also see that there's no, uh, the icon of Firefox is no more here, right? So what we will do is just go ahead and run this command. So uh, what this command is actually doing is uh, it's adding the repository of Mozilla Team to our Ubuntu. So we'll just go ahead and paste this and we'll just hit enter. And again, it's, it will take some time uh, to process and I'll fast forward the video. 
just go ahead and hit enter and it will just uh, start adding the repositories to your Ubuntu. Uh, let's just uh, make this window a little bit bigger so we can see. Uh, we can see it more clearly. Okay, so here you can see that all the processing has been done and this right here is, these are exactly the same warnings that we discussed in the previous uh, lecture. In your case, you will not see them, so don't worry, this is not an error, these are just, uh, just warnings. So what actually happened is that it added the repository to Ubuntu and then it updated uh, our, uh, our operating system. So that's just, uh, that's the only thing that that has happened. What I'll do, I'll just go ahead and clear this uh, so we don't have uh, too much mess here. After that, just go ahead and copy all of this command together. It's not a line by line thing. You have to copy this, all, all of this together and then paste it here and then run. Okay, so here what you're telling it that uh, the next time you will, you will be installing Mozilla Firefox, you're telling your laptop that prioritize, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, uh, link that we have added to the repository, right? Now in the next step, uh, of course, over the time, your Firefox will, uh, will be, you know, getting updates and you want those updates uh, to be embedded in your Firefox, right? And you don't, you don't want uh, to go on the internet and do it yourself. So in order to uh, perform a self-update, uh, this is, uh, we are writing this command, right? So the, uh, these are unattended upgrades. You don't have to, uh, you know, do them manually. So just go ahead and enter it. And after that, what you have to do is just uh, install your sudo, uh, your Firefox through sudo, right? So uh, just go ahead and enter this and your Firefox will be installed. Just go ahead and hit Y and hit install. Okay, so now you can see that our Firefox has been installed in Ubuntu. We'll just, uh, uh, you know, let's just go here. We will, uh, you know, click on this menu and we'll see that if our uh, Firefox has been installed or not. And here you can see that our Firefox has been installed in the system. If I'll just click here. Here you can see it loaded up so quickly as compared to it loaded uh, before, right? Before it took so long uh, to get loaded. But now, uh, because we skipped the snap version of uh, Firefox and installed it without snap, uh, it loaded up very quickly. So that's how you can speed up your uh, computer. In the previous lecture, uh, we installed Firefox without snap package manager and we saw that how quicker it got. Uh, so for the same reason, uh, in this lecture, I will show you that how we can use other package managers as a replacement uh, for our Snap package manager, which is a built-in package manager of Ubuntu. First of all, we'll see that uh, where we can find the web app store of Ubuntu, and then we'll see that how Snap package manager influenced that web app store. So just go to this menu, click here, and here you can just simply write a software. And here you will see the icon uh, and it's named as Ubuntu software. Just click on it. And here you see we have uh, the web app store for Ubuntu. Here you can find all the uh, very famous or mostly used applications. Uh, just uh, go to this search bar here and type. And as a result, you will uh, find your uh, app that you want to use uh, from this app store. So I'll just show you that how Snap actually affects this. So we'll just select a random application. Uh, let's say we're talking about VLC. We want to install VLC. Let's just click on it. And just on clicking here, you can install your VLC. But if you just uh, take a look here, it's telling you that this VLC belongs to Snap Store. 
right? If you just go back and click on another software, which is OB, uh, OBS uh, Studio, it will again show you that it also belongs to Snap Store. Uh, so basically, this entire web app store belongs to a Snap Store as a built-in feature, right? Uh, in this lecture, we will uh, install another uh, package manager, which is called Flatpak, and uh, that is very quicker as compared to Snap, right? And it is very easy to set up. All you have to do is uh, let's just first close this one, and then just open up your terminal. Open the terminal. And uh, you can just write uh, like sudo apt install flatpak, right? So right now we're using this apt uh, package manager to install flatpak, right? Uh, because we do not want a snap package manager. We'll just hit enter and of course we will have to add the password. And it will just install your Flatpak very swiftly. Just type Y and hit enter. And it will just start to download your Flatpak. It has fetched everything. Now it will just process and install everything. Okay, after you have uh, installed or downloading your, downloaded your, uh, you know, uh, Flatpak, there's something else that you need to set up and that's uh, that's called uh, genome software plugin flatback. Uh, you can call it genome, you can call it gnome, uh, whatever you want to call it. Let's just set this up. Uh, so we'll just say the sudo apt install gnome software plugin because we'll, we want to install. I mean, this is a plug plugin that we want to set up for flatback. And after that, we'll just uh, correct the spellings and we'll just hit enter right so of course uh, yes and then hit enter and it's gonna take some time again fetched everything now it, it will just process process it and that's the I mean these are the main uh, steps that we ne needed to follow let's just clear this terminal and now we'll just uh, add the repository of flat back to Ubuntu just like we did in the previous uh, lecture for Firefox. So we'll just say that sudo flatback remote add if sorry if not exists then flathub Go to Flathub and HTTPS flathub.org dot repo oh, sorry slash repo slash flathub dot flat pack repo. So that is the address to the repository. Let's just hit enter and it should uh add the repository of flat back to Ubuntu. Okay, now now that it has been done, let's just uh, restart our operating system. The sudo reboot should restart it. Uh, now that our Ubuntu operating system has been uh, rebooted, uh, let's just open up our Mozilla Firefox and we'll also open our terminal. So uh, we will first uh, verify uh, if our flat pack has been installed in our operating system or not. And then after, after that, we will just go on the Google uh, to a flat hub website to install the softwares. Now let's just go ahead and uh, go to the flat hub, uh, which is a web app store for Flatpak, and we'll just hit enter. 
And uh, after that, we'll just click on this first link and it will uh, take us to the official web page of uh, Web App Store, uh, which is supported by Flatpak itself. Uh, so remember when we uh, installed uh, Web App, uh, so remember when we installed earlier uh, from, uh, I'll just open up uh, uh, from this Ubuntu uh, software, uh, then we saw that this web app store is supported by Snap, right? Now, uh, we what we are doing is, instead of using this web app store, uh, we will simply use this web app store, right? And it is uh, supported by Flatpak. For example, uh, let's say I want to uh, install, let's say I want to install Chrome. I'll just click on it and it will take me uh, to the page of uh, Google Chrome and after that I'll just uh, go ahead and click on this install and a small file will be downloaded I'll just click on it and my uh, Ubuntu software installer will catch that file and it will load it and after it loads this this file we can install this software using Flatpak I'll just show you everything uh, before we just when we used Ubuntu's web app store, it was supported by uh, Snap. But after uh, this app will be loaded, I'll show you that this app is actually supported by Flatpak. Okay, now uh, as this app has been loaded in your Ubuntu's software installer, you can see here. Uh, before when you uh, searched for any application in Ubuntu's web store, a uh, web app store, you saw that it was from a uh, snap, right? But in this case, you can see it, it is from Flathub uh, and it is supported by Flatpak. So just go ahead and hit install. So your application gets downloaded and installed. I'll just uh, fast forward this video because it's going to take a few minutes uh, to get downloaded. So here you can see that uh, Google Chrome has been installed and we'll just click here to, uh, you know, pull up the Google Chrome. Okay, so it's uh, asking us that if you want to make Google your default browser, at the moment I don't want that, so I'll just uncheck this. And the second thing is that it's asking me that whenever your Google Chrome will crash, then we'll just send uh, the error to Google automatically so yeah why not so i'll just click ok and after this our uh, google chrome should come up i'll just close this uh, this software installer and i will again close this uh, firefox as well and here you can see uh, our google chrome has been burnt so that's how you can install any package any software uh, anything from flatpak uh, web app store and it's really faster as compared to the snap package manager so in this lecture we learned that how we can install a flat pack package manager uh, into our Ubuntu opening system and how we can install uh, different softwares and apps using uh, flat uh, web app store instead of using snaps uh, web app store which comes built in in our Ubuntu operating system and the reason why we're doing this is uh, that uh, Flatpak is much more faster and quicker as compared to Snap Package Manager. So in this lecture, we will customize our terminal itself. We will change its appearance, its colors, uh, its text uh, to make it a little, a little more beautiful and uh, a little more cooler. Obviously, you can uh, change uh, all the settings according to your needs and your desires. I'm going to just... Uh, show you the ways in which you can do that so let's just open up this terminal and let's put it on this side and now you can see that this is pretty much the standard terminal that we get in our ubuntu uh, so just click on these three bars and go to preferences uh, now this is the setting menu from where we will uh, change the settings and when uh, we will be changing these settings we will uh, see the progress on the right hand side so let's just go to this unnamed uh, tab and switch to colors let's just uh, try to change colors first right 
So first of all, we have a use colors from system theme. Uh, so this is the system theme, right? Uh, this is the default uh, setting, default uh, configuration and appearance of terminal. If you want that, then just check this. If you don't want that, if you want to customize it, then just uncheck this. And you can see that uh, the colors of uh, the terminal has been changed. You can uh, go with, uh, you know, predefined themes. Uh, it's like white on black, right? So if you just type right now, so it means that the background is black and what you're doing is white. So it it's just like this. Uh, and then we have this, uh, you know, dark we have this dark purple background with white text and a uh, green computer name and desktop is in blue and these symbols that we have uh, in front of our uh, desktop or this column is also white and our cursor is also white right so we can change all that let's say we want sunrise dark so this is the theme that we will get uh, you can see this time our text is not uh, white it's kind of grayish and so is our cursor so that's how you can change these settings uh, and right now you 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 can see that your terminal uh, background is not transparent at all and if you want to make it transparent just go ahead and click this all right so as soon as you, you click this you can see it's a little bit transparent and you can control its transparency with this slider just slide to left to make it less transparent and to the right to make it more transparent, right? So you can just play around with this according to your needs and your desires, right? Then we have this palette, uh, these colors palette, uh, which we will be using, I mean, uh, whenever we will do uh, for every single step, for every single uh, part of the terminal, we'll have different color, right? If, if I just go ahead and install uh, sudo uh, apt update for example and if i'll just go ahead and uh, enter my password so uh, these are the different colors like the link is you know uh, orange and all of these settings or, or all of these uh, you know processed links they are all gray right so we can all change that uh, let's say i want to change uh, uh, I want to change this color, let's say, right? This is the parrot color. You can always change it. Uh, let's just click on this color and let's select something else. Uh, let's make it a little red. So let's just select the color and you can see that this color has been changed. If you want to change uh, the color of this thing, you can always just go ahead and click here and you can change this. For this, I'm going to just take a random color because I'm just showing you that how you can do this and select it. And here you can see this desktop has been changed to yellow. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to change the text, you can always go here. And if you want to make it white, just select the white color. And you can see all the text uh, is white now. If, if you want some other color like if you want blue then simply just go ahead and select this right now i'm not defining a color uh, scheme for my laptop because i'm just showing you uh, the way in which how you can do all this uh, so you can do this according to your needs and your desires right so let's just turn this into green just for the moment right I'll just decrease transparency a little bit and I don't like this background so I'll just change this background as well. Uh, so let's see that how a blue looks uh, behind green. Uh, it's kind of cool but it's not uh, the ideal one, right? Uh, but right now my my purpose is, is not to, you know, set the theme itself i'll just you can just play around with the colors uh to you know select uh, which one looks more good right okay so i'll just uh, leave it at this for the moment uh or you know just select a little darker background so we can see the terminal more clearly okay uh and uh, let's say we have uh this warning color right so probably uh, we, if we change this color from here 
maybe it will change uh let's make it red for example and here you can see these warnings has been turned to red even though this is a, this is not an error right so that that's how you can you know change in the color scheme of your uh, laptop or, or of your terminal sorry to meet your desires right so that's how you can actually do all of that uh, so now you know that how you can change the color scheme of your terminal, right? I'll just switch it back to uh, orange uh, Because these are just warnings. These are not errors. So if, if we just you know uh, Give them a red color. So every time uh, they will they will show up uh, We can get confused that they are they might be some errors, right? So I'll just uh, switch them back to orange color okay so that was a little bit about uh, the colors themselves if you want to change the text then just switch to this tab and here if you just click on this uh, icon you can change the size and the font of your uh, terminal uh, here you can see that when i enable that uh, checkbox the terminal got a little more bigger and now the font uh, size is also bigger and the font uh, itself is different right so if you just go ahead and click here we have a list of different fonts that you can use in your terminal right so let's say you want to use this use this font and from this slider you can select your uh, font size so definitely obviously this uh, big font is not very cool we'll just you know stick to 12 maybe uh, let's just try this so here is your terminal now your font and size has been changed uh, you can select the font according to your desires according to your needs again uh i think it it's not looking very good uh, yeah maybe this one is fine and if you okay if i'll just scroll down and here if i'll just clear this you can see my cursor is a block and it's blinking, right? So you can also change this cursor. For example, if you, if you don't want block, if you want a beam, so you can, you know, just uh, change it from here. Now it's not a block, it's just a beam. And even if you don't like this, you can always use underline itself. So here you can see your cursor is changed to underline. Now if you want your cursor to blink, then it just, you know, go with enabled. If you don't want it to blink, then just uh, disable it. So right now you can see it's not be it's not blinking at all. all right, so that's how you can uh, you can uh, control the behavior of your cursor itself. And that's pretty much it. That how you can customize your terminal according to your need to make it a little more desirable to your eyes. So that was the I mean how you can customize systems uh, default terminal. Now we will see that how we can install a, th a theme for this terminal to look uh, more beautiful. So for that, we will install uh, a theme itself, uh, which is called Star uh, Starship. So we'll install it uh, with the help of uh, uh, Snap. I'll just open up my preferences again. And because I like block, so I'll just... You know, change this underline to this block and I'll just enable the blinking. Okay, so it looks fine. Obviously, I'm going to change uh, this background or we can just simply go ahead and go with the system theme, right? So I'll just go to colors and I'll just click on this button and everything just got, to, got back to how it was before. Okay, now let's just uh, install Starship uh theme for your terminal and for that you have to do a sudo snap install uh starships oh i just made a mistake here we have this start um i wanted to write starship okay uh even starships is not a present okay so it was a starship it, it wasn't starships right so yeah my bad so it's being downloaded now and of course it's gonna take a couple of minutes maybe a couple of seconds based on your internet connection 
Uh, so I'll just fast forward the video from here. So we save our time. Okay, now uh, we can see that uh, this Starship has been installed, but we uh, still have to configure it and embed it uh, to our terminal. And for that, we have to change a file in our Ubuntu system, which is called bash rc. Uh, now, if we just go ahead and type ls uh, hyphen la, then you will see a list of, uh, okay, uh, we should see a list of okay if i just go ahead and type it here okay still no i'll just go back and i will just go back and here i will try to uh, write this command okay yeah right before we were on the desktop directory so we, we were not able to see all these files or uh, you have to go to your root directory uh, to see these files, right? So here you can see we have a file called .bashrc. Uh, this is the file that we were looking for, right? We have to change this file. So if if you just, I mean, in Ubuntu, if you just want to uh, open up a text notebook, you can simply just type here text editor, right? So in graphic user interface, it's called text editor. But if you want to operate it using terminal, then you will call it as gedit, right? So its name is gedit when uh, we use it on terminal. Now we want to open up uh, this file with a text editor. So we'll just say that gedit dot bash rc, and it will open up our bash rc file. So here you can see uh, point bash rc file has been opened up. We'll just scroll down at the end and we'll just add a line after this. Uh, we will write evolve a double quotations dollar sign bracket starship init bash and inverted commas closed. So we'll just go ahead and uh, save this file and we'll just close it and we will close this terminal as well let's just open up this terminal again and now you'll see that your terminal is changed so before we, you were seeing your computer name and that uh, you know uh, that was that, that that didn't look so cool but now you don't have all that let's say i just want to you know uh run a command let's say i want to see that what is present in my current directory so for that we use ls, which means list. So I'll just write this and we can see all the, uh, you know, directories that are present in the current directory. If you want to go to uh, this downloads directory, then you can simply write CD uh, downloads, right? So now you are in downloads and then again, you can see that what is present in your downloads folder. So now you can see that this terminal uh, where we were actually uh, seeing uh, our computer's name and their directory name and you know what uh, what not now it's all clean right you can just simply write clear so you don't have any mess here any mess at all so that's how you can customize your uh, terminals theme to look a little more cool in this lecture uh, we will install apache uh, web server in our linux machine uh, so Apache is a free of uh, charge web server that we can install in our Linux based environments uh, to host our websites or web pages, right? So it's very simple to set up. Uh, let's just uh, I go to our Mozilla Firefox and uh, I have just opened up this instructions that how you can install your Apache and it is on the official website of Ubuntu. So let's just go ahead uh, with the installation process. So first of all, you need to know that Apache is a open source web server that is available for Linux uh, servers uh, free of charge. So you can host your uh, websites or web pages on your uh, Apache web server. And, uh, and those web, web pages and websites will be visible to everyone around the globe uh, if you, you know, make it live, obviously. 
so uh, let's just go to this uh, second tab which says installing apache so first of all what you have to do is open up your terminal uh what i'll do i'll just make this a little shorter and we'll keep this window and the terminal side by side so we can see both of them together uh, so here we have our uh, web page from where we, we will see all the instructions and on the right hand side we have our terminal so first of all what we have to do is we have to update uh, our ubuntu obviously it's always a best practice to update even before installing something uh, so i'll just enter the password uh, because i'm doing it as a super user and of course it's gonna take a couple of seconds uh, uh, to process everything so yeah i'll just uh i'll just fast forward this video uh the processing part of this video just to make this uh video or lecture a little shorter right okay now that everything has been uh, updated i'll just go ahead and clear this prompt and the very next thing that we need to do is install apache 2 so we'll just install it using a sudo apt install apache2 and it's probably gonna ask you for the confirmation so just type y and hit enter and after that it, it will just start to download it okay so now you can uh, see that uh, your apache has been installed as well we'll just scroll down and we'll go to the next step and see that what we need to do now okay so at this point uh, your apache is uh, installed and now it's time to create our, our own website we'll just create a test web page and then we'll see that if we can access it or not right so the very first thing that we need is to uh, move to this var uh, slash www and then uh, in that in this folder we want to create uh, a subfolder uh, with any name that we want uh, in this case they have used gci as an example so we'll just uh, use the same name uh, you can write any name you want uh, i'll just paste it here and i'll tell you that this is what i'm talking about you can rename it anything like you can write even test here or something else that you want to give to your website in this example they're using gca so we'll just stick with that because this is just an example uh, to make you understand that how you can create web pages and how you can set up your apache to uh, access your websites from anywhere so we'll just uh, hit enter and uh, this uh, uh, mkdir DIR actually means that make directory so we have created uh, this gca folder inside war slash www now next what we have to do is uh, move to this folder so this cd actually means change directory right so we'll just simply go ahead copy this and paste this so we can move into this folder and then in the inside this folder we'll just uh, go ahead and create uh, our index.html file uh, now html is a uh, language that we use to create websites or web pages so i'll just use G added uh, index.html. Hopefully, it will start uh, a text file. It will create a text file which we can write. Yeah, there we have it. Uh, so you can see they have used nano. This is another text editor that you could use in your uh, Ubuntu operating system or in any or Linux based uh, environment. I'll just copy this text here because this is the text that we will see uh, in our test website right so the title of the web page will be ubuntu rocks and on this page we will see i am running this website on an ubuntu server so i'll just go ahead and save it uh or maybe oh yeah it's telling me that i do not have permissions to save this file so probably we'll we'll just have to do it with nano so i'll just uh, close without saving and here i can write nano index.html and i'll just paste everything here 
So this is how the, your nano looks, right? So we want to save this file. Just hit Control O, and yeah, we want to uh, write the this file with this, with the same name. Just hit Enter, and after that, we want to exit your file. Then just hit. Uh, okay, it's again giving us permission denied. So I'll just exit this. Uh, yes. Oh, let's hang. I mean, yes, I'll exit and now, okay. So we'll try with sudo, sudo nano uh, index.html. Uh, let's see if this works. And then we will have to, if, if it doesn't work, then we will, you know, uh, do it some other way. So I'll just try to save it. Okay, with sudo privileges, the file was saved. Now you want to exit, just hit Control X and your index.html has been created. Right, so basically your test web page has been created. And obviously in, re in real world examples, you will not uh, create this basic website. You will obviously create with a website which will have uh, multiple animations, multiple pages, menu, navigation bar, uh, body, header, footer, you know, or all those stuffs. But even in that case, no matter how complicated your website is, the steps will be exactly the same. That's why we we are doing it now. Now, in the next step, uh, we what we have to do is we have to uh, activate our host. First, we have to create create it, and then we have to uh, activate it. It's just like a hosting website where uh, you upload your website, and then they you know bring that website uh, on the internet. Right, so at this point, you have created your website, and now we have to host that website, right? So for that, we'll just go ahead and click on the next step. Uh, so it's very, very, very simple to do. We What we have to do is just uh, go to Apache uh, to, uh, folder, and there we have a folder called sites available. We have to go to that folder. So I'll just go ahead and copy this command, and I will paste it here. Uh, yeah, we are inside that folder now and inside that folder we have to uh, write this command uh, To configure our GCA website, right? I mean, uh, that's the name that we chose, right? So all we have to do is just uh, We are saying that whatever the command is present in this configuration file uh, Copy this the CP means copy or all of that and create a new file called GCI dot uh, config and save all the content as it is in in that file. We'll just hit enter, and because we're using sudo, that that that's why we did not face any error. If we didn't use uh, sudo, it will give us error because here you can see it's a locked directory, right? And you can see this lock here. Okay, what we need next is uh, we need to add it our GCI config. We have to add something inside it. So what we will do is. Uh, Uh, we'll just copy and paste it here and your file will be added now uh, Against this server admin you have to add your own email address just like I mean it's mentioned here, right? Uh, I mean you should have your own email address. So I'll just uh, As an example, I will write my own email address here uh, Let's say we can call it what the heart uh, gmail.com we'll write it out enter and then we'll exit uh, and now what we want is okay I, I think we also have to uh, I mean set this directory as well in the same file so just open it again yeah uh, we have to change it change it ch yeah we have to change the directory in your document root so because we are working on GCA, so we'll just tell uh, our file to look for GCA folder in www folder. So we'll just replace this HTML with GCI. And uh, server name should be gci.example.com. This is the website that we are creating. So we don't have it here right now. So we'll just go ahead and add it ourselves. So we can say that server name uh, gci.example.com so this is the complete website that 
uh, if people will enter it in into the URL box of any browser, they will go to your test website that you just created, right? Uh, so I think that should be it. We'll just write this, enter, control X to exit, and I think uh, it should be done. Now we have to activate our host, right? We, we just created our host, uh, our hosting uh, service, and now what we have to do is just activate it, right? So we'll just write sudo a to inside gci.config. Uh, this is gci.config. We are activating this, right? This is a configuration that we just uh, set up. Okay. So, hey, it's telling me that your site GCA is enabled. Uh, to activate the new configuration, you need to run uh, this command, right? Uh, so, what we can do is just copy it here. And then we can simply paste it here. Of course, it's going to ask you to enter the password because you are changing something, yeah, right? You are starting a ser service. So just enter your password and authenticate. Okay, now your uh, Apache server should be uh, installed. Uh, let's just go ahead and check it out here. Uh, in the browser, we, we will just type gci.example.com because I think that was the website that we set it up. Uh, if we just enter it, uh, our test uh, web page should come up. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't, then we'll just look at what we did wrong. Okay, uh, we did not connect, get connected with this. So what we'll do, we'll just uh, use this command, service Apache reload. Uh, yep, let's see. Again, it's asking us to enter the password. I'll just enter the password and authenticate it, and then we can again try. Uh, but somehow it's still giving us a, an error. Uh, so let's just see that what is actually going on. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, this uh, something that we can do. We can actually check the hosts if we have uh, or if uh, the previous steps. Uh, did set up the hosts for gci.example.com or not. So for that, what we will do is a sudo nano because every time we use nano, we need sudo, right? So sudo nano, uh, I think your hosts are available in etc folder. And we'll just write this, uh, type in the password and yeah. So yeah, you don't have, uh, I mean, you did not uh, set up your GCI uh, dot the example dot com anything or any, you know, any IP address, right? So what you can do is simply, I guess, we, sh we can write this for that. And here we, we can write GCI dot example dot com. So this should solve the issue. Just write uh, control O enter and control x and let's just uh, reload our apache uh yeah i'll just enter the password and it's i mean uh, our apache start restarted let's just try it one more time dci.example.com okay so now your uh, problem has been solved i mean you can see that uh, we actually wrote that I am running this website on an Ubuntu server, server. And here you can see the title of the page is Ubuntu Rocks. Right? So that's how you can install and run Apache server uh, in your Ubuntu operating system to host any web page or, very, or any website. So let's just go ahead and, cl no, I mean, let's just uh, stop this service because we do not need it just now. Uh, yeah, and to do that, you all you have to do is just write stop instead of reload.
again you will have to enter the password and we'll just close this web browser and your Apache has been stopped. So in this lecture, we learned that how we can install Apache web server and how we can host a website uh, in our Ubuntu operating system. In the previous lecture, we installed Apache uh, web server in our Ubuntu operating system. And after that, we created a custom website and then we hosted that website on Apache web server. In this lecture, we are going to learn that how we can install and configure engine X web server on Ubuntu operating system. Now, both of these web servers works almost in the same way, but some people just prefer engine X over Apache because it's a little lighter and a little faster as compared to Apache. So to the, the steps in which we can install uh, engine X are uh, almost similar. Uh, to the steps in which we follow to install Apache and you can just go to this URL and you will just find this article which is uh, present on the official website of Ubuntu. Alright, so let's just go ahead and follow the steps uh, to install and configure Nginx web server. So first of all, uh, let's just take an overview of Nginx. So Nginx is uh, an open, open source web server that is often used as a reverse proxy or HTTP cache. And it's available for free on Linux operating system. So uh, let's just click here and jump right into installing Nginx. So uh, this is just to update your system. We ran this command a couple of times so we don't need it. We'll just uh, skip this one and we'll just uh, jump right into installing the nginx itself so uh, we can just copy and paste this command here and it should install your uh, nginx in your uh, ubuntu operating system it's going to take a couple of seconds based based on uh, your internet connection and after a couple of seconds it's gonna install everything in your operating system so hey it's telling me that it took uh, almost 16 seconds to install Nginx, as soon as your installation has been done, you have done everything to install Nginx and you can access this uh, page, this Nginx page, just like you accessed uh, Apache's homepage on your web browser. Just open up a new terminal and right here, uh, this localhost uh, command. Okay, so the reason uh, it gave us this error uh, because we did not start the service uh, Nginx service. So let's just install a sudo service nginx. Sorry, I took that literally. Uh, nginx, and I'll say start. Uh, it will start your web server, and after your web server has been installed, you can see you have you can access your nginx web server page. Uh, this is the default page that comes uh, when you install your nginx for the first time now what we will do we will uh, create a custom uh, website just like we did in the previous lecture and then we will host that custom website on our uh, nginx web server so we'll just click on this next button and here, here we can create our own website so first of all let's just go to this directory uh, so whenever you create a web page, you you can you, you will go to this directory, uh, which is this www, right? So it also indicates the websites, right? Uh, whenever you go to Google, you write www.google.com, right? So just remember it uh, with the help of this perception. Okay. As soon as we are in that uh, directory, we will create uh, a new directory, uh, sudo mkdir and they are they using this name tutorial we will not use this name uh, let's just uh, uh, think of another name let's say that we are just writing custom so custom is the name of our folder on which we will you know create our website so let's just enter this oh sorry there was a little error we have to write mkdir so yeah uh, and then uh, you will just go to this custom uh, folder that you just created and so you can see that there's nothing at this point in this uh, custom folder 
Now what you have to do is you have to create an index.html file which uh, which means that you want to create a very basic custom website, right? So for that you will write a sudo nano because nano is a editor that we used in the previous lecture as well and then we will write index.html. Right, so we'll just uh, scroll up and you know uh, copy this and paste it here and then we will write control o enter and control x we'll just clear this so right now we have uh, installed our nginx we have started our web server and we have created a custom website now we want to host that website just like normally we do we create a website and then we pay someone to host that website right so we will uh, create our own host in our Ubuntu operating system. So all you have to do is just uh, copy this path and paste it here. Now, not this one, see it here. Hit enter. And as soon as we are inside that folder, we will create a file sudo uh, nano because we need editor and remember we are not using tutorial we are using custom so we'll just create that and inside this we'll simply go ahead and paste this right so uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the server name or website that you can associate with your uh, custom web page we can change it we can write let's say example or we can simply write ubuntu ubuntu and here we can write custom right uh, and we want to change this folder because we did not create tutorial folder we created custom folder right and yeah it should work Okay, so let's just go ahead and save this file with Control O, Enter, and Control X. Right, so now we have uh, set up our virtual host as well. And now all we have to do is just restart our Nginx. So we'll just copy this command and we'll paste it here. And it will take, yeah, it just restarted so quickly. So we can simply just write, uh, Enter here, refresh this page. It will look exactly fine. But as soon as we listen on 81 port, here is our uh, custom website that we just created. And we put that custom website on our virtual host. So in this lecture, you learned that how you can install and configure Nginx a web server. And you saw that how you can create a custom website and host it using uh, Nginx uh, web server. So mostly, in most cases, web developers or engineers use uh, these web servers to create websites and then run and test those websites. Of course, you cannot uh, upload a website and then start testing, right? So uh, during development, uh, what uh, developers actually do is either use either they use Apache or either they use Nginx, and then they create their websites and then they you know uh, make them live using these virtual hosts. And after that, they uh, do all, all kind of uh, testing and improving stuff. So let's just say that you are an engineer and you've been working on a project. Now you also have to make presentations about that project when you will pitch the idea or the project to the client. So that means somewhere along the way, uh, you are going to have to use presentations. You, you, you're going to have to create presentations. You're going to have to create uh, Excel sheets. You're going to have to create documents that you can send to your clients. Uh, normally what uh, people do is, you know, just install Microsoft Office. But when you're using Ubuntu, Ubuntu has its own uh, built-in Office suite. And we'll just go ahead and see what that is. So all you have to do is just... Uh, hit your Windows button on the keyboard and type LibreOffice. You can call it LibreOffice, you can call it LibreOffice, whatever you want to call it. So where you can see, uh, we have a uh, LibreOffice. I'll, I'll just click on it so it will just open up. And when it will open up, you'll see that we have every single option that 
uh, Microsoft Office gives us. Okay, so here you can see uh, our library office uh, suit has been opened up and on the left hand side we have a couple of different options. We have a writer document which will create our docs. We have this uh, calc spreadsheet which will create our excel sheets and then we have impress presentation which uh, will be working as a powerpoint in the case of microsoft and you can also uh, draw shapes and uh, write your mathematics formulas as well so let's just go ahead and open them one by one and see that how we can use them and how they look like so first of all i'll just open up this writer document so here you can see we have our word uh, file uh, which is also called library office writer uh, here you can see it's almost exactly the same way how our Google Docs or our Microsoft Word looks like. Uh, we have all the taskbar uh, uh, on the top and then we have this page and then we can write here, here uh, just like exactly like how, how we do it in Microsoft Word. For example, uh, let's just write this. This is uh, my test doc, right? So you can save this file and just go here and save as and name it whatever you want, obviously, and then you can save it. And it works exactly the same way as Microsoft Word does, right? So all you uh, you can do is just you know name it. Let's 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 just name it uh, test, right? So from here you can select the extension. Just click on here. So here we have uh, multiple uh, options in which we can store them. Uh, we can store them in ODF uh, text document format, or we can uh, we can also save it in the docs format. And we also have a couple of different options that we can use. You can also save it as a text format, right? Uh, just exactly the same way you do with the Microsoft Word, right? So I'll just go ahead and select this one, and then I'll just write uh, this save, and you can see. Uh, it's asking you that uh, do you want to use audio format or do you want to use word format so I'll just uh, select this one and as a result you can see your test.docs has been saved right so we can simply uh, I think we saved it on the home directory so we can just open up our home or we have oh yeah we saved it in, in documents so here you can see our test.docs has been uh, saved right so that's how you can use library uh, word uh, now let's just see if you want to use excel you can just simply search for it uh, i think we will have to search for spreadsheet or you could just write excel and it will just uh, you know give you this option uh, which is uh, library office calc spreadsheet and it also works exactly the same way as uh, Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets work. So here you can see uh, this is the exact same layout as Microsoft Excel. And this, this is, these are the cells in which we write our data. And on top of the document or file, we have this uh, taskbar to do different kind of stuff. And that's how you can, you know, uh, use your Excel and you can also use uh, PowerPoint. Uh, all you have to do is just write presentation and this icon will come up. Just click on it. I'll close this. And here you can see our uh, library office impress presentation uh, has been opened up. Uh, again, it, it looks exactly like uh, uh, Microsoft's PowerPoint. I know I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it's exactly the same thing. You can select multiple uh, themes from here, uh, whichever you like. And let's say if I want this, I'll just click open and that theme will open up, right? So it's nothing new, nothing different, nothing crazy that, uh, I mean, uh, that will make this Office suit uh, different as compared to Microsoft Office. So here you can just, you know, write and uh, you can, you know, uh, change its uh, position, right? So everything that you normally do in Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, you can do all that here as well. And here you can see on the top, we have uh, taskbars as well, right? From the right hand side, we can, uh, you know, customize our text. We can uh, select uh, the fonts, the sizes, uh, bold, italic, uh, uh, underscore, or underline, sorry. So everything that we normally do in our office suit, we can do that 
using Ubuntu's built-in library of his suit. Right, so uh, uh, let me quickly just uh, s uh, close this and let me show you the mathematical uh, library of his mathematics uh, software as well. And here you can see uh, in uh, in Google Docs you get uh, an option where you can create or you can write mathematical formulas, create fractions and that kind of stuff. All of that you can also do here in, in this uh, library of his math uh, software, right? So hey, this is a drop down menu. You can uh, select whatever uh, thing you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, trigonometric uh, ratios or you're looking for, you know, exponents or square roots. Uh, I mean, you can go to different uh, sections here to find whatever you are looking for, right? So that's how you can write uh, mathematical uh, equations in library office math software as well. So that's it. Uh, uh, for this lecture. Now you know that if you want to uh, work uh, with uh, Microsoft Office, you don't actually have to install it. Ubuntu offers you a built-in Office suite uh, that works exactly the same way as Microsoft Office would work. And it is very light and it is very uh, easy to use as compared to Microsoft Office. It's It works exactly the same way and you can get a hang of it very quickly. So in the previous lecture, we installed web servers and then we uh, created custom websites and then we hosted those websites or uh, those uh, web servers. Uh, so uh, we installed Apache 2 and we installed uh, Nginx web servers and we saw that how they work. But when uh, you work with uh, websites, uh, you have to work with databases as well because on those websites, you're going to have to enter some information and that information will be saved somewhere. So uh, to save that information, whenever you create a website, you have to create a database as well. So when we talk about creating databases, there are multiple options that we can uh, look into. Uh, we have uh, MySQL database, uh, we have uh, uh, MariaDB, uh, we have uh, uh, so many other options that we can utilize based on uh, our requirements. Uh, so in this lecture, we are going to be setting up uh, MariaDB database and we'll, uh, we'll install it, configure it, we will authenticate it, we will uh, make it secure and then we will create a database and uh, we will create a uh, users as well. So uh, let's just go ahead and uh, see that how we can do all that. So before doing anything, just like always, uh, don't forget to update your uh, Ubuntu. So just write sudo apt update, uh, but obviously uh, it's not gonna uh, update too much because we have uh, done this so many times by now. I'll just go ahead and enter this password here and uh, in a couple of seconds uh, the system uh, will uh, will be updated. So I I think I have made some mistake with my password. I'll just re-enter it. And yeah, uh, your update uh, is just initiated and it will just take a couple of seconds. Okay, so uh, now that we have updated everything, we'll just go ahead and clear this terminal. And now it's time to install MariaDB. And uh, the way we will install it, we will install its server and we will install its client. Right, so to do that, just go ahead to this uh, second command. Uh, I'll just copy uh, this command and uh, I'll just paste it here. Oh, so th there's a mistake with this install keyword. I'll just make the spellings correct and I'll hit enter. And of course it's gonna uh, download the package and then it will install it. I'll just uh, hit Y and then enter. So basically it uh, it's not a very huge file, so it will be downloading very quickly. And after uh, being downloaded, it will get installed automatically just like we have it installed so many packages by now uh, in the previous lectures. So after installing it, uh, you should know that, I mean, uh, MariaDB is present in the Ubuntu repositories. Uh, that is the reason it's 
it is installed with apt package manager right uh, but you have to know that this uh, is not the latest version uh, of MariaDB and if you want to get the latest version of MariaDB then uh, we will just go ahead uh, to this third command I'll just copy this and we'll wait for this progress to be completed I'll just fast forward the video here okay so you can see that our uh, uh, MariaDB is installed at least the initial step uh, then we will just go ahead and paste this command this third command to get the latest version of MariaDB I'll just hit enter and again it will ask you to confirm type y and then hit enter and of course it's going to take a couple of seconds i'll again fast forward the video okay so uh we should have the uh, latest version of maya db uh, now now the next step is to import the jpg keys for this database uh, without it the installation is not uh, complete so i'll just go ahead and copy this command and i'll just uh, paste it here and i will hit enter okay so now that we have imported jpg keys we have to add mariadb to our apt uh, repository in our ubuntu operating system so to do that we have this very simple command i'll just again copy and paste this i'll just copy it and then i will paste this command and i will hit enter and it should add mariadb to our ubuntu repository in our computer i'll just hit enter okay so now that we have uh, uh, added mariadb to our uh, apt repository now it's time to refresh our local repos and uh, reinstall uh, our mariadb server and client i'll just go ahead copy and paste this command and i will hit enter and here you can see the processing uh, is initiated it will first update your ubuntu and then uh, it just updated your uh, MariaDB server and client. Now let's just see if our uh, uh, if if our uh, MariaDB version has been installed or not. I'll just copy this command and uh, I will just paste this here. So here you can see. Uh, let 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 me just clear this. Uh, here you can see we have MariaDB version 15.1. So that means our MariaDB is installed. Uh, in our Ubuntu successfully. Uh, now let's just uh, check the status uh, that if this database is live or not, uh, just like uh, in the case of uh, Nginx or Apache, we uh, you know checked their status and then we uh, restarted them and you know stopped them uh, whenever we need it, right? Just like that, we will just first see its status and we can start it and stop it based on uh, our needs right so to uh, check its status right. just go ahead and copy this command i'll just copy it and i will paste it here right uh, so here you can see it's saying that your uh, maya db is running so in case it was not running let's say it was inactive here so in that case you will just run this command I mean you will just change this keyword from status to start uh, and your MariaDB service will get started and uh, suppose if you want to uh, you know uh, deactivate this MariaDB then you all you have to do is just change this word to stop just like in the case of Apache and uh, Nginx right so I'll just hit Control C to get outside Okay, so in the next step, uh, we can enable our MariaDB to start every time uh, when we switch on our laptop. So you don't have to restart it every single time manually. So let's just uh, do that and I'll just copy this command. Again, you can see uh, the status uh, keyword uh, is replaced by enable, right? So the rest of the command is almost same. I'll just hit enter okay so uh, it has synchronized uh, now whenever you will turn off your laptop and then you will uh, switch on your laptop the MariaDB will uh, get activated automatically okay so now it's time to uh, i mean 
we have started this database so obviously databases are uh, if if you don't secure them they have loopholes they have they have those vulnerabilities that can be exploited so to make them secure all you can do is you know just uh, go ahead and run this command which says uh, sudo mysql secure installation so i'll just uh, go ahead and now it's asking me if you want to uh, set a password for your database of course a uh, password is the most easiest way to make your things secure so i'll just go ahead and set a password here so uh, it's telling me that uh, do you want to switch to unix socket uh, authentication or not so but before that it's also telling me you already have your root account protected that means you can safely answer no your system is already protected i'll just follow its instructions and i will just hit enter okay so i'll just write uh change the root password no i don't want that remove an anonymous users yes uh disallow root login remotely yes uh, remote test data set and access to it okay reload privilege uh, tables now yes okay so now your MariaDB is set now you can just you know log in to your MariaDB as a root and to do that uh, you will simply just write copy and paste so it's uh, telling me that okay go to MariaDB and you want to log in this is a user you means user user is a root so you want to log it as root and then dash p is password if i'll just run this command it's gonna ask me to enter the password so i'll just enter the password which i uh set in the previous steps i'll just write the password okay so now you have uh, entered in your mariadb terminal so your mariadb is uh, initiated and now whatever you will write it it will take it as a command so you can create your databases destroy the uh, see your databases all the tasks that you can do with your database themselves right so all everything will be written here so let's say I want to create a user in my database and then I want to uh, give that user the administrator privileges. First of all, let's just create a user first. So for that, all we have to do is just write this command. I will uh, copy this and I will paste this. Okay, so first of all, you, uh, you should know that this says that create a user. Obviously, a user's name uh, will be admin user and we are creating this user on our local host so if we were creating a let's let's say if uh, we have a website online that is present on the internet it's not written locally on your internet or your on your uh, apache let's imagine that the website is online so that means that website will have some kind of ip address right so in that case that ip address will come here right uh, but now because we are running this locally so that means uh, we are writing a local host instead of uh, the ip address of the website uh, okay so we are saying that on this ip address create this user and identify this user by this password so you have to just change this password write it whatever you want in my case i'll simply uh, right one two three four five six seven right eight let's say and i will just hit enter so it's it told me that your query is okay i have done that right so it, it, it it's showing here zero zero rows affected because you have not changed any row of the database you have just created a user that is completely irrelevant okay so the next step is to give this user administrator privilege privileges right so to do that just copy this command and just run it and this part right here shows that this user will have every single uh, privileges this user can do anything uh, create a, a database remove a database create, create an entry in the database remove it do whatever you want so this part actually shows this and you can see that the command is grant all privileges on static dot static 
to admin user that we just created and where is this admin uh, user it is on this ip address right so we'll just go ahead and hit enter okay so now we gave all the privileges uh, to your admin user and now it's time to apply these changes and to do that you can write flush uh, privileges so i'll just copy this command and i will just paste it and okay uh, you should know that this uh, command syntax this method uh, is uh, mysql language right so earlier when we were securing the uh, mariadb uh, you also might have noticed that we are actually executing mysql secure installation right so i'll just go ahead and hit enter to apply all these changes that i have created okay so now uh, what we can do is we can simply just exit this database and to exit we have a simple command exit so now we have uh, gotten outside of our database and now it's time to test our maria b okay so now let's just uh, log in to our maria b using that admin user that we just created right so to do that uh, we'll just go ahead and copy this command and we will just paste it here and when we we will enter this command it's going to ask us password and this is the password when what you uh, wrote when you were uh, setting your admin user right so this is in this command you are setting your admin user and your password was this right so just go ahead and type this here one two three four five six seven eight right i'll hit enter so you have just logged in your mariadb using admin privileges now, now this user this admin user can do anything it can create a database it can remove a database it can see all the users in that database you know and and lots of other stuff that that ad administrator can do okay so let's just see that how many databases do we have right now uh okay first of all you should know that because we have uh, logged in successfully in our mariadb so that means our mariadb our maria database is installed successfully and it is working absolutely fine now we are just going to play with this and just run a couple of different commands to see uh, what are our databases how many users uh, are there how we, how can we create a database right so let's just go ahead and uh, paste this and hit enter so right now we have these uh, databases which are ob obviously a uh, built-in databases uh, they were already there we did not create them let's just go ahead and create a, create a database right so for that all we have to do is just copy this command and then enter it okay so as soon as we entered this command uh, it, it told us okay uh your query was uh, applied and one row is affected because now we have created a data set a database let's just go ahead and run this command and see that if our database has been created so before it were it was three databases of oh, sorry four databases right but now we have five because we just created this uh, test database test underscore db and here you can see in this row we have this test d, uh, underscore db and that is why it told us that one row is affected because be before we had four rows and now we have five rows right okay so you can give uh, this uh, user you can apply all these changes i mean you, you just created this database right now after creating you have to apply this change so whenever you uh, re-log into your mariadb or start your mariadb this uh, database stays here right right so without restarting your mariadb you can just use flush privileges and it will uh apply all the changes without uh, restarting your database okay so uh, uh, we actually had to do this right so we had to do this semicolon at the end of privileges okay so now uh, our query is uh, our query ran and everything is fine right okay so what if uh, you want to see that how many users are there in your database right so to do that uh you can just run this command so that means uh so first of all let's just uh understand uh, what this command is 
So we are actually uh, looking into a table called mysql.user and from that mysql.user uh, we are selecting two columns which is user and host right if i just run this command you can see two columns have been printed out the first one is host and the second one is uh, user and here you can see we created this user admin user and then we uh, remember earlier we logged it as a root uh, user right so this is that user right so if we just want to see that how many other columns are there in this table it might be possible that this table only contains two columns but let's just see then how many columns actually are there in this table right so to do that just uh, go here and remove this and write static so in mysql static means everything so we are just asking uh our mariadb go to this table and from this table select everything right so let's just hit enter and here you can see we have uh, we will have to i guess maximize this to see okay so we have our host we have our user we have passwords we have select private insert private update private so many columns we have right so from all this a table we just uh, extracted two columns uh, when we selected host and user if i just go ahead and let's say uh, instead of user i extract password so here you can see uh, against those host uh, we got the passwords instead of extracting host let's just go ahead and uh, extract user so we have these users and uh, against them we have uh, all the passwords right so these first three are built-in uh, users right they are present in the configuration of your pyrodb you created this fourth user right so that is why password is only uh, showing in against that uh, user that you just created in this database and this is not actually the password because uh, it, every time uh, no matter what the database you're using uh, when you store a password to make it more secure it is encrypted so this is the encrypted uh, form of your password right so that's how you can play around with your database that's how you can install it you can configure it make it secure set passwords create databases see users remove databases right uh, so I'll just minimize this again and because we have done everything so we'll just quit now right so it's, it, it just told me okay bye so everything the entire MyRDB has been closed right so let's just go ahead and check and if it's running then we can simply just stop it if we don't uh, want our database to keep running Right, so just paste this command and replace this start with stop. First of all, let's just see if, uh, if it's running. Yes, it's running. Uh, then let's just stop this service. And let's check again to see what happened. So right now you can see that your MariaDB, this database is dead or inactive. Right, so that's how you can play around, start your database, stop your database, check its status, and do all sorts of stuff. Right, so in this lecture, we learned that how we can install MariaDB, how can we configure it, how can we uh, import is its uh, uh, GPG keys, how can we make it secure, how can we set passwords, how can we log in using new uh, admin user account. We actually also set up the user in our local host or in our database. And at the end, uh, we also saw that how we can uh, visualize the data uh, databases. How can we create a database? How can we uh, import columns from tables? And I mean, how can uh, see all the users that are present in our database? In this lecture, we are going to be discussing that what is a Linux bash. Uh, so we can call this 
bash as a bond again shell uh, which actually is the replacement of uh, shell I mean, you can call this bond shell right so these are two different kind of interpreters command language interpreters that uh, Linux based distros actually use right so before all the systems uh, were compatible with this uh, SH and now the they most of them use born again shell which is called bash as a built-in command language interpreter right so just like i mentioned that it's just a command line uh interpreter uh, but uh what differs in bash is you can also use it as a language programming language as well right uh i mean it it supports variables uh, it supports functions and uh, flow control just like all the programming languages out there it can also read and execute commands from a file uh, and those commands which are uh, also known as shell scripts right in the previous lectures we use commands like this sudo apt install something right so this is a command we can also call it a shell script because we are adding this script inside this shell this terminal is also known as shell right so uh, your bash uh, uh, command language interpreter or a programming language it has the capabilities uh, from reading uh, the commands from a file and execute them in one code right so that's how uh, it i mean that's how much powerful it is so uh, I mean, if you want to verify that if your system supports bash or not, all you have to do is just go ahead and write which bash. And if you see this, uh, which actually is showing that in your uh, bin directory of user folder, uh, you have bash, right? So it just shows you that yes, your bash is installed in your system. Uh, so mostly, if you if you're using Ubuntu uh, and you downloaded this uh, in a couple of uh, I mean months back or year back. Uh, it will it will probably support bash because all the new operating systems uh, are supporting this as a built-in function, right? So uh, you can verify this uh, by the which uh, bash command. I'll just go ahead and clear this. Uh, so this is the use of bash. This is the main overview that what a bash actually is. Now let's just go ahead and see bash in action, right? So suppose if you run a very basic shell script or shell command in your terminal, you say that date. Uh, it will uh, give you uh, the date, uh, I mean, of today and time uh, as well. And let's say if you want to, if you if you also want to print a calendar, right? So if here you can see we have this calendar. I mean, there's no specific purpose of these uh, scripts. But all I'm trying to do is uh, we we will work with a couple of different uh, uh, scripts or commands individually, and then we will use bash. To automate this process right so you can use the same process uh, to do uh, the real life tasks that you that you will need in your life right uh, suppose there's another command which is called pwd you don't have to worry about this uh, what this command uh, what this command actually is we will uh, see this or the use of this command in uh, bash directory module so suppose we have uh, uh, these three commands let's just go ahead and add another command i'll just write ls here Right, so ls is uh, simply just a command which lists all the content in a directory in which you are right now. So right now we have uh, written four different commands. We have uh, written date, we have written cal, which is for calendar, we have written pwd, and we have written ls, which is for the list. Right, so what we will do is, I mean, right now we did it individually, but we can also automate it with the help of bash scripting. And for that, all we have to do is just write nano because nano is just uh, uh, just an editor, text editor. And then let's say, uh, first of all, let's just change the directory. Let's just go to desktop. And here we can go for nano or instead you can use gedit. It's uh, a little more user friendly, gedit. And then we will write tasks dot sh because we want to create a shell script right so i'll just open up this and uh, text editor will open up with the uh, with the name of this i mean here, here you can see we have this task dot sh now here inside this we can write uh, date and we, then we can write cal then we can write pwd and then we can write ls right 
So, uh, uh, I mean, we can just simply save this. And here you can see my task.sh has been saved, right? What I'll do, I'll just go ahead and close this. And what I will do is, uh, I will just go ahead and try to execute that uh, .sh file using this terminal, using bash, right? So first of all, I have to change the mode of this file from uh, script to executable, right? So for that, we use ch mode, which is actually change mode, right? And then we, uh, we will use this argument. And then we will write the name of the file that we want to work on. Right, so after this, all I have to do is just uh, write this and then tasks and I will enter this. And here you can see, first of all, date has it printed out. Then calendar has it printed out. After that, the answer of pwd.directory has it printed out. And after that, all the uh, files that are present in this current directory has it printed out. So what we did uh, before individually, now with the help of this bash uh, uh, scripting, we automated all that. So that's how you can use your Linux bash in your Linux-based distros. Let's just talk about environment variables in Linux, right? So these are the dynamic values uh, that are stored within a system and uh, they're used by applications launched in shells uh, or subshells. Right, uh, and these values obviously have names and uh, corresponding values stored in them. Now, when we talk about environment variables, we should know that we uh, they can have information uh, about default applications of the system. For example, they know uh, about system locale. They know about the path of the execu uh, executable file. Uh, for example, they know uh, your keyboard layout settings and much more whatever that uh, currently your system is using all of that that information is stored in multiple uh, environment variables right so uh, the very first variable that we will uh, talk about is path variable so uh, when we talk about path it's kind of similar like uh, setting up a path in windows operating system so whenever you install a new application you have to uh, tell your Windows operating system that I have installed this new software in that directory. So whenever I will call you uh, to start this application, go and look uh, for this software in that specific directory. You know, uh, and that's how we set the path of a new software like Anaconda or Pip or Python or FFmpeg software, right? Now, same is the case for a Linux operating system. When we talk about path variable, in this variable, we store all the information of new uh, softwares that we install and we save the directories in which we have uh, stored uh, the values of those uh, softwares and we uh, migrate or add those directories to our path variable. And we tell our Linux system that whenever I will call uh, a new software in terminal, go and look for that software in this directory, right? And that's how uh, your system recognizes your new uh, newly added softwares or applications, right? And we can uh, actually go ahead and see this path variable and we can see that what kind of information it has in it. So for that, all we have to do is just go ahead and use echo. No, echo is a command that uh, helps you in seeing the value of a specific variable. Uh, now, if we just go ahead and write this path, it will uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, give you this path as a as an output, right? Because you just ask this echo uh, to print this, right? So it's kind of like printing something. It just printed path. If you want to know the value of this path, all you have to do is write this dollar sign before your variable. Now, if I just go ahead, here you can see, uh, we have this uh, this couple of uh, different uh, information in it, right? If you if you just pay attention to, to this information, you will see that a uh, few directories are separated by these columns, right? Uh, it is something else. Uh, this is for something else. Uh, this is for something else, right? So let's just go ahead and talk about this. Right now, if we just go ahead and install your games right, or if there are any built-in games in your Linux operating system, they are installed in this user slash games directory. So if I just go ahead and write a game here, for example, I write a name of the game and I 
uh, enter that name in the terminal and I hit enter, this terminal will go to this directory and see if the, any of the game that I just called for is present in this directory or not. Right? So if that uh, game is present there, then this terminal will recognize it and it will initiate that. If that game is not present there, then the system will just tell you that uh, whatever you have asked me to do, uh, I don't know about it, it will give you an error, even though if you have installed that game correctly, right? So it's very important that when you install something, make sure that uh, its value or its installed directory uh, is added to the path of your system. Otherwise, even if you, you have installed your application correctly, your system is not going to recognize it, right? And hence, it, it's not going to initiate it or execute it, right? So uh, this is how you can, you know, access the content of your path. And if you want to uh, add uh, your newly uh, installed softwares directly to the path of the system, all you have to do is uh, just go ahead and uh, I should say you, you can write export and then you will call your uh, path variable, right? And then here you will just tell that go to this folder, for example, if I have installed in a folder, right? So what you can uh, do is you will write slash bin anaconda3, right? So uh, you will tell your path variable uh, or you will give uh, this value to your path variable that whenever I just uh, write anaconda or conda command in terminal, go to this directory and see if anaconda is installed. If it's there, then recognize it and do whatever, whatever I'm asking to do. If there is not, then it will just go ahead and and give you an error, right? So that's how this is the syntax in which you can uh, set uh, the path uh, to your uh, newly added software, right? And export is uh, just a command that will uh, help you to do that. It helps you in setting up the uh, values uh, to environment variables, right? So when we talk about environment variables, you should know that path is not the only variable that we deal. We have uh, other sorts of variables as well. Uh, let's just go ahead and uh, see a few of them. Uh, so we will use echo to print the value of uh, environment variable and we have an, an environment variable called user. So here right now it's telling me that Marshmallow is a user. So uh, exactly when I try to log into my computer, uh, at the login state it asks me to enter the username and password, right? So there I, uh, there I enter Marshmallow and then the password, right? So that, that's why it's telling me that this is the user right now of this operating system. That's how, uh, oh, that's the user that you're working on, right? So that's how you can see that how many users are present in a, in an operating system because there might be a possibility that there is a guest user, uh, which uh, I mean usually is uh, is the case when you are working in schools or colleges or offices, right? So if one account or one user is an administrator user and the other user is just a I draw a user or student user, right? So that's how you can see that how many users are present there. Uh, another variable that we can see is uh, UID, which gives you a unique ID to your uh, user, right? So to do that, again, use echo and write UID here. And here you can see that this thousand is uh, the unique ID of my user Marshmallow. If you want to see that uh, where is your bash installed that we just uh, discussed in the previous lecture. You can write echo. And then you will write shell here. And it will tell you that it's present in bit bash. Now, uh, when we talk about this path here, uh, you should know that this path is by default user uh, bin and then bash right so this user is default right and everything that we install in this system will be inside the user folder so that's why i just omitted that and t told you that go to bin and then inside the bin just go to this bash directory and there your shell is installed right so that's why you don't see user here uh, there's uh, another command which is uh, env uh, let's just go ahead and see that if we can print it here like this Okay, so what you can do is simply just go ahead and write this command and here it will give you all the variables that are currently present in your uh, operating system and 
against them, it will also give you all the values that are stored in it. For example, here we have this shell we just saw. Uh, this was its value, right? Uh, we have another variable called home. And here you can see this is the home directory of Marshmallow, right? So this is Marshmallow user and this is the home directory. And just like that, we have all the other uh, default environment variables of this system and their values stored against them. Now, after we have uh, done all that, there is a way in which we can create new environment variables, which is the case when you install a few applications. Few applications just require that you create a new environment variable and store their own values in it, right? So I'll just go ahead and clear this. And what we can do is we can understand the uh, syntax of setting up uh, an environment variable, which I showed uh, a few minutes ago as well. So it's like new variable and then equals and then this is the value, right? So export helps you in setting up uh, the value to the variable. Uh, this is the name of the variable and equals the value of the variable that you want to store, right? So let's just go ahead and use uh, the exact same name and instead of value, I will write 56, right? So if I just go ahead and enter it, uh, this new variable has been created. You can see uh, if this has been created or not. You can use echo uh, dollar sign new variable. And here you can see as a result, we have 56 uh, with us. So that's how you can create your own uh, environment variables for uh, application specific tasks, right? There is a way in which we can delete these new environment variables as well. And for that, all you have to do is use this unset and then the variable uh, that you want to delete, right? So in this case, that variable is new variable. So I'll just go ahead and write new variable, right? So just like that, you have deleted this variable. If I just go ahead and try to print that variable again, hopefully uh, the value will be deleted, right? So right now, because you just deleted that new variable, so that's why uh, when we asked echo to print the value of this variable, then it just gave you this blank prompt because there was nothing inside it. So that's how you can work with uh, uh, setting environment variables and the default environment variables. In this lecture, we will be working with two uh, shell commands. Uh, the first one will be pwd uh, and the second one will be cd. So we'll just go ahead and work with these two commands and see that how we can use them and what these commands actually do. So first of all, we'll see that what is PWD, right? So PWD actually means is a print working directory, right? So it will just print the directory uh, in which you are right now, right? So I'll just go ahead and remove this. And here in this directory, we'll just go ahead and it uh, and, and we'll see that right now we are in this directory, right? So uh, if we, if I just want to uh, uh, move to desktop, so all I have to do is use this cd command. Uh, now what this cd is actually means is it means change directory, right? So it what it does is it lets you uh, navigate uh, between folders and uh, directories in your Linux operating system using. Uh, bash uh, terminal, right? Because right now you're, you're, you're using this terminal which supports bash, right? So if I want to go to desktop, all I have to do is write desktop, right? Here you can see uh, right now I am in my uh, desktop for folder uh, which comes uh, after the root directory in which I was before, right? So this is my uh, user. Uh, in the previous lecture, we saw that how this Marshmallow is a user, right? So it, I was in my root directory right now. But uh, after that, I just changed my directory to desktop, right? If I just go ahead and print this ls, so ls command actually means list. So it lists all the content in your uh, current working directory. So here you can see we have all this content in this desktop directory. And you can see that behind uh, this terminal, we have all of this in it, uh, all of this available, right? So well, here we have, uh, I mean, uh, exact same content here. 
So, uh, I mean, we have changed our directory from uh, root to desktop. Let's say I want to go to this uh, uh, Ubuntu directory, right? So, uh, all I have to do is just write uh, Ubuntu. CD Ubuntu, right? And here you can see the path has been changed, right? So, uh, if you just go ahead and write your PWD command here, here it will give you the entire path uh, to this Ubuntu folder, right? So, you started from form, then you went to your uh, Marshmallow, then you went to your desktop, and then uh, you went to this uh, Ubuntu folder, right? So, this is the entire directory path. Right, let's go ahead and clear this. Okay. So, uh, uh, I mean, this is uh, a step in which uh, you went to Ubuntu step by step. First, you uh, went to desktop, and then you went to uh, Ubuntu directory, right? Uh, there's another way in which we can specify the entire path and it will take you uh, to that folder in one go. For example, if I want to go to this Blackbird folder, right? So all I have to do is write CD. So I'll just uh, start from my uh, root. I will write home. Then I will write Marshmallow. Then I will write Desktop. And then I will write Black. Okay, so if I just write this incomplete name and if I just go ahead and hit the tab button, it will complete the directory name if that directory is actually present on this path, right? So in this way, you can also uh, verify that if you are going to the going on the right path or not. If I just go ahead and hit enter, here you can see uh, this has been changed to Blackbird, right? What I'll do, I'll just write PWD, and here you can see it. It it is showing me that right now I am in. Blackbird uh, directory. So that's how uh, you can use a definite path to uh, go to from uh, a certain directory to another directory, right? So let's say if you, if you want to go to uh, the uh, root directory, right? So uh, what you can do is write cd and then uh, write this tilde, right? So after this, if you if you just hit enter, here you can see all of the path has been changed. If I just go ahead and write PWD, it has taken you to your root directory, right? Which is a slash home slash marshmallow. So uh, this is how you can, uh, you know, navigate uh, to your root directory from wherever you are in your uh, in your terminal in, in just one command. Okay, so let's say, mm. I'll just hit this ls. Let's just go to this uh, pictures uh, directory, right? So I'll write, Ping directory. Uh, I, I hit uh, dab and then I, I'm just inside my uh, picture directory, right? So, uh, okay, so we have nothing so far in this directory. Suppose I want to go to the previous folder, right? So all I have to do is write cd, then hit space, and then write two dots, right? So it will take uh, me to the parent directory of this pictures directory, which in this case is. Uh, your marshmallow, right? Uh, first of all, what I'll do, I'll just write PWD so we can see the path uh, to this pictures folder. So right now we have home, marshmallow, and pictures, right? So what I'll do, I'll just write uh, CD and space and then two dots. I'll hit enter and then I will write PWD. So you can see that first I was in pictures dictionary. Now after I ran this, com this command, uh, what happened is it took me to the parent directory of this pictures folder, right? So parent directory is marshmallow, so it took me there. So here you can see when I printed out the path uh, of uh, the working directory, I got home uh, slash marshmallow. Okay, suppose uh, if I just go ahead and uh, create a folder here, I will name this something like test folder. So here you, you, uh, you may notice that I'm putting this space between the name of the folder. I'll just go ahead and create this folder and I will uh, paste it here so it's more visible. Okay, so what I'll do, uh, I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll just go to my desktop uh, directory. I'll write cd slash home slash marshmallow slash desktop. Right, so right now I, I am in my desktop directory, right? So I'll just go ahead and uh, put this ls command to list all the content. So here you can see I have this test folder, right? If I just go ahead and write cd test folder, and if I hit enter, it will give you uh, an error that uh, you are giving too many arguments to cd. 
because right now you are giving two names because of the space it it's considered uh, two separate words right so uh, cd can only take one right so it's telling you that uh, you're giving too many arguments and it, it gave you a bash error right so to solve this what you can do is for the folders uh, that have uh, 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 space uh, in their names you can use in uh, inverted commas uh, or quotation marks right just like they are written here so uh, you can just simply go ahead and copy this you can type it as well i'm just copying it i will write cd and then i'll just paste it and now if i just go ahead and hit enter it should take me uh, to the next folder okay so it it will give me an error because uh, we didn't have any uh, inverted comma here so i'll just go ahead and it drop this and i will re uh, enter this command i'll put quotation mark here as well and then it will hit enter and here you can see we are right now in test folder directory without any error i'll just go ahead and add write this and here you can see we have this uh pwd command so there's another way in, in which you can uh, migrate to a folder uh, which has space in its name i'll just go to my previous folder to the parent folder and what I will do, I'll write CD and then I will just write test and then I will use space. So here you can notice that between uh, test and folder, we have this slash, right? So this slash and space uh, identifies that the name of the folder uh, has space in between these two names, right? If I just go ahead and hit enter, here you can see you are again in your uh, test folder directory. So that is how you can migrate to different directories uh, that have a space in their names, right? So there is a difference between uh, this slash and this slash, right? Uh, this one, sorry. So uh, this one, this slash specifies the directory and this slash specifies the space between the name, right? So uh, if you just go ahead and I mean, if I if I want to go to uh, my root directory, right? So for that, uh, we usually write home and then we write marshmallow, right? And we are simply here. What if I just go ahead and want to uh, write the other slash here? I'll write this slash home and I will write this and I will print mark, write mark and then I will write tab. And I'm pressing the tab, but here you can see uh, it's not completing the name because this slash is not for directories. This slash is to specify uh, the space between uh, the names or, uh, you know, titles of the folders, at least in this context, right? So that is how uh, you can play with the uh, folders which have space uh, in between their names. So right now, so in this lecture, we learned that how we can work with PWD which is print working directory and cd which is change directory in this lecture we are going to be looking into ls commands in detail we'll see that uh, what are the different options that we can use with uh, ls command right so uh, i mean when we talk about ls uh, we you we have used it uh, in previous lectures as well what this command actually uh, do is uh, it lists all the content of your present directory, right? So first of all, what I'll do, I'll just uh, uh, write this pwd to, to see in which directory I am. So what I'll do, I'll just go ahead and use this ls command here. So here you can see it's giving me all the content uh, that is present in this Marshmallow folder, right? Uh, we have a couple of different folders, uh, desktop, documents, downloads, music, uh, pictures, public, snap, templates, uh, video, and we have uh, uh, applications as well. We have this uh, uh, this file called uh, installing Firefox, and then we also have something, uh, or we can say a software, uh, which is a, a CUDA uh, repo Ubuntu, which is used for GPUs, right? So this is all the content that is present in this Marshmallow folder, right? And we have uh, viewed it with the help of this ls command. So that's uh, what this ls command essentially does. But there are a couple of different options that we can use to, uh, you know, enhance its uh, capabilities. And you can uh, go and look for uh, those options with this uh, help option. 
right? So you, all you have to do is just write your ls command and give this command an argument and that will be dash dash help. So it will give you uh, all the possible options that this com uh, ls command, you know, uh, uh, it supports, right? So I'll just go ahead and maximize this window so we can uh, visualize everything more clearly. So these are all the different options that you can uh, work with uh, while uh, using uh, this ls command, right? We will not definitely use all of them in this lecture, but uh, I'll just go through a different, uh, a couple of different options that we can uh, use with this ls command. So uh, first of all, we'll use dash a, right? So what this uh, command actually does is, uh, I'll just write this. So what this command actually do uh, is it shows all the files that are hidden inside a folder, right? So a couple of times we have a different uh, folders of files that are uh, for system uh, settings, right? Or, or they belong to system configurations. And for some reason, they are not visible uh, when you open up that directory using your file manager or something, right? Uh, just like here, if I just go ahead and print this ls command, we have these uh, folders and files that we can see. Uh, but if I just go ahead and write this a, uh, dash a argument with this ls, it, it's going to show me all the hidden doc, uh, documents or or files or folders that are present uh, in this directory and they are saved there with the uh, by this operating system, right? If I just go ahead and hit end depth, here you can see we have uh, this dot bash history dot bash logout dot cache dot config dot bash rc, uh, you know, and here you can see we have uh, dot uh, less hst we have dot local dot mozilla so these are all the uh, hidden files that were saved here by the operating system right uh, you can access these files as well i mean if you want to go to this uh, uh, or check this file uh, this dot bash rc all you have to do is write nano which is a text editor and then you will write bash rc right Obviously, you're gonna be using that dot um, uh, in before writing bash rc because that shows that this file is hidden, right? And here you can see this is uh, the entire file that you just uh, that is saved in in bash uh, rc, right? So here you can see its name as well. So what, what I'll do, I'll just go ahead and exit this file. Uh, so uh, I mean, that's how uh, you can use ls dash a to uh, see or list all the hidden files as well the next coming up uh, we have dash l right so if i just go ahead and uh, uh, you know write this command it's giving me uh, this uh, uh, all of the content folders and files that are present in my marshmallow folder right but if you want uh, all these files in a list format right so for that all you have to do is write dash l if I just go ahead and run this, here you can see now all the files are formatted in a list format, right? Uh, these columns, they are actually have different meaning. Uh, the first column here actually shows uh, all the uh, permissions uh, to this uh, to this folder. Uh, then we have a number of links uh, to this folder in this column. Then we have a group, uh, which group this folder belongs to. Then we have who is the owner of this uh, of this folder, and then we have the size of the of the file, right? So this shows the size, and obviously it, it is in uh, KBs, right? So that's how these are these are all the uh, bytes. Sorry, not not in uh, KBs. Uh, it's in it's in bytes. So that's how it's uh, written so long. It means that this CUDA uh, repo Ubuntu it's in uh, it, it's around three gigabytes, right? So that's how it, it's the it's that huge number written here. Then comes uh, month, date, and then comes the time in which, on which uh, this file was saved. And then comes the name of the file or the folder uh, or the content that is present in the folder, right? So that's how, uh, this is what all these columns are actually showing us. Okay. So now that we have discussed that what uh, does uh, dash L do, uh, let's see uh, what, uh, what does dash lh do right so i'll write ls dash lh right so here you can see uh everything is almost the same but the only difference is this column right here we, we we got the size of the file in by in in bytes right 
uh, now uh, that is present in kilobytes or gigabytes or megabytes and here you can see uh, for gigabyte it will uh, represent or it will print g for kilobyte it will print uh, it will print k right so just like i mentioned earlier this CUDA file was around 3 GB, right? So that's why it was showing uh, this in, in, in bytes, right? So uh, here you can see we have almost 3 GBs uh, of space associated with this file. Okay, so the, this is what your ls-lh does. So let's say if you want to sort this, uh, the all these files in a, in a, a descending way, right? So the most heaviest file, it comes first, then after that, uh, the less heaviest, then after that, the less heaviest, right? In descending order, uh, in terms of their size. So all you have to do is write ls-lh. So until this command, uh, it's the same, but then you will uh, give this uh, character, which is s. If I just go ahead and run this, here you can see, uh, first I have this CUDA file, right? Just like... Uh, before we had this CUDA file, right? Uh, but now, after that, the files were written in, in random order, order, right? And the way we can verify is that installing uh, Firefox, it was only uh, 4, 7, 9 bytes, right? So, and all the other files were around 4 KB, right? But now, after we, we ran this uh, command, you can see that uh, it's in descending order. Here we have 2.9 GB, then we have 4 uh, KB because all the files are around 4 KB. And after that, uh, this installing file, uh, Firefox is uh, coming at the last of this list. And because it's uh, it, it occupies the least size, only 479 bytes, right? So that's how you can uh, uh, rearrange the content or the list of the content of the directory with uh, dash lhs command so moving forward we have another argument let's say ls uh, and then we will use this dash d uh, static this uh, slash right so what it will do is uh, it will uh, display all the sub directories in the in the in the directory that you're working on right so right now when we uh, implemented the above commands it was showing us everything. It was showing this CUDA. Uh, its extension was .deb. Uh, it was uh, showing us this installing uh, Firefox. Its extension is .txt. And then it was also showing us the subdirectories, right? But uh, if we just run this command, ls-d uh, static slash, it, it's going to uh, show us. Oh, okay, so I made a little mistake. And the mistake is... Uh, I think we gave too much space here. Okay, so uh, here you have to give space between D and static, right? So here you can see, now we have only subdirectories. We do not have this CUDA file. We do not have this installing Firefox, right? So if you want to see all the folders or the subdirectories in your current directory, then just go ahead and run this command. I'll just clear this terminal so we have uh, less mess up here. Okay, so uh, the very next thing that we have is uh, dash r. I mean, we just saw that how we can uh, list all the, uh, I would say, all the subdirectories of a, of a current directory, right? What if we want to see the content of those subdirectories as well? So for that, we use uh, an argument called dash r, right? So let's just go to desktop because we have less files there. And I will use ls.r. And here you can see, first we have this uh, folder name. Inside the Ubuntu folder, we have Velodyne folder. And inside uh, Velodyne folder, we have all these bin files. Then uh, in, in the Ubuntu folder, we have another folder called label underscore two, right? So in that folder, we have all these text files. Right, so we have in Ubuntu, we have, uh, I mean, content, uh, this file, which is a text file, and these two file, uh, folders, right? Label underscore two and Verodyne uh, folder, right? We, uh, which we saw here. Okay, so in the Blackbird folder, we have templates folder, in template folder, we have static folder, in static folder, we have media folder, and in, in the media folder, we have all this content, right? So it, it will go to all the subdirectories and it will list all the content of those subdirectories step by step. 
right? So that's how you can use dash R uh, to to display all the content of the subdirectories, right? So uh, if you want to check the, uh, I mean, uh, let's say I am in desktop, right? Uh, uh, let's just go to this uh, this Ubuntu folder, right? So I'll just go to this Ubuntu folder, and I will list all the content of this uh, folder. So we In this lecture, we are going to be discussing two new uh, shell commands. The first one is mkdir and the other one is rmdir. So mk uh, comes from make and dir comes from directory. So it means that we use this command to make directory. And rm comes from remove and dir again comes from directory. So it, uh, it's usually... Uh, is used to remove the directories from your system, right? So first of all, we'll just go ahead and work with uh, this mkdir. The, the way in which you can use this uh, command is just write the command. And in the argument, all you have to do is just write the name uh, of the folder that you want to create. So first of all, what I'll do, I'll just uh, go to desktop uh, so we can actually see the folders uh, being made Right, so I'll write mkdir, and here I will create a folder called files, right? So I'll hit enter, and here you can see the files folder has appeared here. Right? So it is as simple as that. Suppose you want to create multiple files, right? So you can name all of those folders uh, as multiple arguments, right? So suppose I can say uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll hit enter. And here you can see uh, we have one, two, three, and four. These four, four folders has been made, right? So that's how you can create multiple folders as well with the help of uh, MKDIR. So just like LS command, we have a couple of different options that we can use to enhance the capabilities of MKDIR. And one of them is dash P, right? So what dash P actually does is uh, it gives you a... Uh, the capability to create parent and subfolders all together in one go. So, for example, if I just go ahead and uh, remove these folders here, so we have uh, uh, space, I'll just remove this. I will let me remove this test folder as well and this folder too. Okay, so let's just go ahead and create uh, a folder and a subfolder, right? Uh, to do that, we have to use uh, an argument dash p. So I'll write mkdir dash p. And here I will give uh, the folder, or the parent folder, and the subfolder in, in the form of a directory path, right? So first of all, I will write the name of the parent folder that I want to create. Let's say it's files, right? And then I will uh, use this slash uh, and I will write the name of the child folder that I want to create or subfolder that, that I want to create inside the files parent folder, right? So let's call it uh, documents. Let's call it documents, right? I'll just hit enter and here you can see the files folder has been appeared. I'll just open up this folder and here you can see inside this folder we have another folder 
called documents, right? So that's how you can create multiple folders like parent folder and subfolder in one go, right? At least uh, we created multiple folders, but they were all uh, different folders in the same directory, right? Uh, there was not a concept of parent or uh, subfolders, right? In in that previous case, okay. So if you want to print out the uh, the output as well, I mean, let's say you want to create a folder, but you want to see the output, uh, your terminal is saying that you have created this folder, right? Uh, so to do that, you can use an argument called dash V, right? So you can say mkdir dash V, and then you will write the folder's name. Let's call it test, right? I'll just hit enter. Okay, so it it, uh, it told me that cannot create directory because test named file already exists, right? Because we have test here. We'll just change the name. Uh, let's call it something else. Where we we can call it. Uh, let's call it Mobase, right? So hey, I mean, before it was creating folders, but it wasn't uh, returning any output. It it wasn't telling you that I have done this, right? But now it has uh, not only created the folder, but it, it also told you that I have created this directory, right? So this is with the help of this uh, dash v uh, argument, right? So now all of this, uh, what we did, oh, it was relevant to mkdir, right? Now comes rmdir, which essentially means remove directory, right? So let's say you want to remove a directory. So all you have to do is write uh, rmdir and then uh, you can write the name of the folder, which in this case will be movies. I want to delete this folder. And here you can see the movies folder has been disappeared from here uh, because rmdir has deleted it, right? Okay, now what I want to do is delete this folder, which is called files. And remember that in this folder, we had another folder called documents, right? So, uh, I mean, how can I delete uh, this folder, right? So, to do that, just like uh, we did with mkdir, we are going to be using dash p argument. I will write rmdir dash p, and then I will write uh, the entire path of these two uh, or parent uh, child folders, right? So, in this case, the path will be files. Sorry. The path will be files dash documents, right? And I'll hit enter, and here you can see oh, everything has been deleted, right? So that is how you can uh, create or you can uh, remove your folders from your system. And if you want to uh, create a log or output for removing a folder as well, then again, just like with mkdir, all you have to do is uh, write dash v here. In this lecture, we are going to be working on two new shell commands. The first one is file and the second one is touch. So uh, the file here used uh, to know the type of file that we are working with or we have in a specific directory. And touch command is actually used to create different files. You can create any number of files or any type of file using this touch command. So first of all, we'll just go ahead and use this file command, right? So for that, let's just go to the root directory of my uh, my laptop. And for that, we use we will use this change or uh, cd, uh, which is change directory, and then we will use this tilde. And it will take us uh, from this desktop files uh, to uh, this uh, root directory, right? So I'll just go ahead and use this ls command. We know that what is ls now. And here we have a couple of different files in this folder. Right, so to know the type of a folder, uh, all you have to do is write file. And if you want to know the uh, type of a specific folder, then just go ahead and write the name of that folder or file uh, in front of this uh, file command, right? So I'll just go ahead and copy this name and because it's too long to type, and I'll just paste it here. And if I just hit enter, it's telling me that it's a uh, data compression XZ format, right? So it's a .tar .gz uh, file, which uh, actually uh, what is, it's a binary 
uh, Debian binary package, uh, which uh, means it's a compressed file. Like in Windows, we have dot zip files dot rar files, right? So in Linux, we have this Debian binary package, which is controlled uh, with dot tar dot gz, and it's a uh, what it actually is. It's a data compression uh, or data compressed file, right? Uh, so that's how it told us that what is the type of this file. Let's just go ahead and see what it, this command gives us uh, in the case of directories. I'll just go ahead and write file and then I will hit uh, desktop. And here you can see it told me that this de desktop, it's actually a directory, right? So you can know the file type uh, with the help of this command. Now there are uh, a couple of different options, just like previous commands that we can use with this uh, with this command as well. And to know all the uh, available options, all you have to do is write uh, hyphen hyphen help. And just like that, we will have a couple of different options here. Of course, we are not going to be using all of them. Uh, I'll just go ahead and use uh, a very common, which, uh, uh, which we use most commonly, right? So for that, first of all, we'll have uh, static. Right, so I'll just uh, give this ls command again to list all the components, and then I will write this file, and then I will write this static. Now remember that static uh, in coding language uh, essentially means everything, right? So you are uh, telling your file command uh, to go in this root directory, and then uh, tell the file types of everything, right? So I'll just hit enter. And here you can see it told me uh, about uh, multiple files, right? So uh, in the case of this CUDA uh, repo, what to file told me that it's a, a binary Debian package. Uh, in the case of all these folders, it told me that they are all uh, directory, right? And in the case of this installing Firefox, it told us that it's a ASCII desk, text file, right? So it's a text file. So that is how uh, you can use this static uh, argument for this uh, file command. So there's another thing that we need, uh, or we can uh, work on, and that is uh, specifying a file directory, right? So, I mean, for example, if you don't want to uh, look for uh, the types of all the files in this root directory, but if you want to see uh, the types of, of the data, on this desktop, you can also do that. And for that, what you have to do is write file, and then you will write the the path to the desktop. You will write uh, desktop, and then you will write static here. So it will list all the types of all the files in this desktop directory. I will hit active. And here you can see it, it gave you uh, for this Blackbird, it told you that it's a directory. Uh, files, it's also a directory. So here you can see this is the file uh, files folder. So it's a directory. This is Blackbird and this is a directory as well. And this uh, installing Firefox, installing MariaDB, uh, uh, task.ash and test, all of these are text files. So you can see all of these as uh, text files. Uh, this is uh, uh, test.txt and it's uh, it's a file, but it's empty. No, nothing has been written inside it. So it told you that it's it's an empty file, right? And then we have this Ubuntu. And Ubuntu, again, is a directory, right? So here you can see we have this Ubuntu. Right, so that's how you can use uh, uh, this uh, I mean, specific uh, directory name to know the types of all the files that are present in that directory. Going forward, you can also put a range on the files uh, for which you want to know the type. For example, let's just go to this directory again, uh, or let's just uh, look for uh, your root directory. I'll just put ls here. Uh, now we, we have been, you can uh, see that we have uh, files uh, whose initial letter uh, is an alphabet, right? So you can put a range on it. I mean, for example, if you only want to uh, see the file uh, types of all the files that range uh, from A to uh, let's say V or A to M, let's say. So uh, you can just write file A M uh, static, right? So what it does, it will list all the files uh, whose first character or vector uh, comes between this frame, right? So I just go ahead and hit enter. And here you can see that between A and F, we only have one file here or one uh, folder that comes between this range. 
uh, and that is uh, your installing Firefox, right? And your CUDA. So that's how it told you about uh, the file types of these files uh, because they were the only uh, uh, files that were uh, coming uh, between this range. And remember, uh, we are talking about files. We're not talking about directories in this case, right? Uh, because uh, we have this desktop and we have this do documents and downloads folder and they come between this range, right? But they are not listed here. And the reason is that we are talking about files only. So when you put a range, uh, then we only get files. We don't get directories. So that is it uh, for file uh, command. Now let's just clear this cross and now go uh, to touch uh, command. So what this touch command actually uh, do in uh, Linux is it helps you create multiple files, right? So you could create any type of file using this touch command, right? So first of all, let's just go to this uh, files folder. I just created this uh, for this uh, tutorial. I'll just go to this uh, desktop. And then I will go to this files folder. And I will just open up this file as well so we can see uh, what we do in, in the terminal, right? So, uh, okay, so here we have a folder which is already created. Okay, so I'll just clear this. Okay, so now uh, we will use the touch command. So just like I mentioned earlier, touch command will help you create any type of file. So let's just go ahead and create a text file. So we can say the touch text test.txt right so if we, i'll just hit enter so here you can see uh, test.txt uh, file has been created right and we can also create another file i mean let's just go ahead and create a uh, touch test.txt remember that everything you do in linux shell uh, terminal everything is case sensitive so before we use small d right and now we have this capital d so that means because it's everything is case sensitive so it's gonna create another file it's not gonna give you an error that test.txt is already present there it's not gonna give you error for error for that it instead it, it, it will just go ahead and create this new file if i just hit enter here you can see the next file has been created right so you can also go ahead and see uh i mean uh uh, their modification times when they were created you know everything like that and so for that, all you have to do is just use this uh, command and uh, uh, the command is stat. And then you will write the name of the file for which you want to find uh, or know the stats for. And in this case, let's just go ahead and use this test.txt with small d, right? If I just hit enter, it will give you all the uh, information about this. Uh, we have this size, we have this blog, we have uh, uh, input output blog, we have... Uh, uh, I mean, it's showing that it's a regular FT file because, of course, we did not create it anything. Uh, and then, uh, uh, we, here you can see we have this uh, access, and against this access, we have these uh, access rights. These are permissions, right? So permissions in Linux are uh, given in this format. Then we have this user, uh, I mean, uh, unique IDs uh, to this file. Then we have this uh, access that when was it, it it was lost uh, accessed right and then we have uh, this modified and when was this file last modified and then uh, when was this file last created right so these are all the stats for a certain file um, you can also check this for the other file which is uh, test.txt right so it's going to give you uh, all the information uh, regarding that okay so what we have, uh, I mean, that's how you can create a, a file using touch command, but there, there are a couple of different options as well that we can use uh, to, you know, enhance the capabilities of this touch command. For example, uh, if what if you want to change the modification time of a file, right? So for example, uh, here it shows that test.txt was last modified uh, on 21.09.39, uh, right? So let's say I want to update this modification time. So for that, I'll just go ahead and use this touch and I will write this M and then I will write the name of the file uh, whose modification time I want to update, right? I'll just hit enter and then again, I will check the stat for th that file, right? So here you can see uh, it was before 21.09.39 and now it's 21.11.55, right? So the modification time, or sorry, this is the modification time. So you can see that the modification time has been changed, right? 
So uh, similarly, let's say if you want to uh, change uh, the modification time of a file with the reference of another file, right? Uh, for example, let's say uh, if you want to change, uh, uh, let's say this file's modification time according to this, and what it actually means is it will just update this uh, file's time or this file's type with respect of the other uh, the other file. So the modification uh, time of this file will be exactly same of this file, or the modification time of this file will be exactly same of this file. Right, so that's that's what uh, relative to another file means. So what I'll do, uh, I just go ahead uh, and I will write touch. And for relative, we use R, and then we will write the name of the first uh, file, and then we will write the name of the second file. I'll just hit enter, and then we can check the uh, stat for both of these uh, files to verify the results, right? And then I will again uh, check. Uh, the start for another file. Okay, so here you can see uh, the first file, its uh, modification time was 210900, right? And before uh, we saw that we changed uh, the stat or the modification time for this second file and it was 211155. But now, uh, after we ran this uh, relative uh, arguments, here you can see the uh, stat or the modification time for this uh, test.txt file it has been again changed uh, exactly equals to the first file that we wrote right so this file's modification time has been uh, changed or became equal to this file right so that's how you can change one file's modification time or stat uh, or access time or change time according to relative to other uh, other file right so that's how you can do it so in this lecture we learned that what is uh, a touch command and what is files command and use for that how we can use them In this lecture, we are going to be discussing uh, how to do more shell commands, and uh, these commands are rm and cp. Now, rm means uh, remove, right? So, just like rm dir in the previous lecture, this is the rm only, which means remove, and we use it uh, to delete files, right? And we can also use it to, the, to delete folders as well. Uh, and on the other hand, we have cp, which means copy. So we use this command to copy a document, a file, of, or a folder, or all its uh, components uh, or content. So first of all, let's just go ahead and see that what uh, this rm can do. So uh, what we'll do, we'll use this touch command to create a couple of different files. Uh, first of all, we'll create test1, uh, .txt, uh, and then we can create, uh, let's say, test2.txt, test3.txt, uh, test4.txt, uh, and we will create thus uh, test5.png. Uh, let's just hit enter, and here we have all the files, right? So the reason uh, I used the, this command twice is because I wanted to show that we can create a single file or we can create multiple files in a single go using this touch command, right? Okay, uh, so what will happen is uh, now we are going to use rm command to delete delete these files, right? So a very simple way to delete a file using rm uh, command is to write rm and then just go ahead and write uh, the name of that file, right? And it will just delete that file. And here you can see test1.txt is not present there right now, right? So this is the most simplest way, but there are other options that we can utilize too. Uh, you know, uh, enhance the capabilities of this command. For example, what if uh, in a folder I have multiple files with the same extension and I want to delete all of them, right? So to do that, we can uh, simply write this rm and we can define the extension that we want to delete, right? So for that, first of all, we'll use this uh, static, which means we want to remove everything. And then we will write the extension. Uh, 
so, so to specify that which files do we want to delete so that this means delete or remove every text file from the folder right if i just go ahead and hit enter here you can see all the text files from uh, this folder has been deleted right so that's why uh, that, that that is how you can uh, use this rf uh, command with uh, static txt to, to delete a specific extension uh, from uh, or from from your folder right so uh, let's say you want your terminal to ask you before deleting something right so for that you can use another flag which is uh, dash i right so let's say i want to delete this test5.png right uh, so for that what we, what you will do is we'll write rm dash i test5.png right i just hit enter and here you can see it's asking me that do i do you really want to delete this uh, file i mean it's asking me that remove regular empty file this so all you have to do is write y here and then hit enter and it will just delete it yeah right so this is uh, the interactive way to remove a file from your uh, folder or from your any path in the system using uh, this flag okay so what if we we have uh, we have folders uh, in which we have uh, another folder right we have folder and then we have subfolders right and uh, besides the subfolder we have multiple files in the parent folder as well so with, what what we'll do we'll just go ahead and create uh, mkdir we'll use this flag uh, dash p and then we will create folder and then we will create subfolder uh, let's say uh, i want folder one and then i have test folder i'll hit enter and here you can see we have this folder one right and if I just go inside it, we have this test folder as well. What we will do, we'll just uh, go to this folder. And inside this folder, we will create files, right? We have touch, uh, let's say test.txt, uh, test3.py, uh, uh, test5. Uh, let's say cpp, right? I'll hit enter, and here we have all these multiple files, right? Now what I will do, I'll just uh, go uh, outside this uh, folder one, right? So right now I'm here in this folder, right? So what if I want to delete this folder with all the contents that it has? If I just go ahead and use rfdir and I will uh, write folder one, it's going to give me an error. It's going to tell me that your directory is not empty. So you cannot delete it, right? So to solve this uh, uh, this issue, we, we can use this rm command, right? And with this rm command, we can use uh, a flag which is dash r, which will delete the folder recursively. So it will delete all the files and all the dash subdirectories from the folder. And after that, what we'll write the folder that we want to delete. I'll hit enter, and now the folder is deleted. All right. So that's how you can use your rm command. Uh, now after our rm command, I'll just clear out this terminal, and it's time to work with the cp which in other words is nothing else but just copy right so uh, before uh, copying something i'll just go ahead and create a file let's say i have this touch test.txt and i will use this mkdir uh, to create a folder i will use this lag folder one and inside the folder one i will create a folder uh, of slash test okay so now we have this folder inside the folder we have this test and in the files folder we have this test.txt file that we just created okay so what if i want to copy this uh, this file into inside this uh, in the, inside this folder one or inside this test folder right so let's just copy your file uh, your test.txt file from this files folder to this uh, test folder so to do that all you have to do is just write copy and then you will write the name of your file which you want to copy which in this case is uh, test.txt and then you will uh, uh, write the path where you want to copy this right so in that case you will write on uh, marshmallow then we have uh, desktop then we have files and then we have folder one and then inside the folder one we have this test folder right so i'll just hit enter and here you can see uh, your text test.txt file is inside your test folder right so i'll just go in into this files folder and we also have this file here in this files folder as well because we copied it we did not move it right so it will just create a copy of your a file into uh, your test uh, folder i just go inside this folder inside this folder and here we have our copy file right so that's how you can copy it so this is the simplest way in which you can use your copy uh, copy command right 
Okay, suppose uh, what I want is I want to copy this folder which has another folder inside it and inside the folder we have content, right? So I want to copy uh, this entire thing, right? So to do that, again, I will use a flag R just like we use an RF command. I'll just write copy and then I will, I will write uh, dash R and then I will write what I want to uh, copy. I want to copy this, right? And where I want to copy this? I want to copy this uh, to my root directory, suppose. So I just uh, go ahead and write the name of uh, or the path to my root directory or home directory, right? So I just hit enter. And if I just go to my, uh, I will say home directory. And I will list all the or all the content. So uh, here I have this my folder one file, right? So if I just go to my home directory, here I have, uh, uh, this is the folder one, right? I'll just open it. This is my test folder and this is my test.txt file that I just copied. All right, so that's how you can uh, well, copy folders and subfolders and content inside those folders all together in one go using uh, dash r flag. Okay, so uh, just like rm, you can use uh, dash i flag in cp as well, which will ask you before copying something. Right, so for example, if I want to copy this folder or if I want to copy the test file from uh, this this test.txt file from this uh, this directory to this pictures folder, right? So to do that, what I will do, I'll write copy, then I will write this dash i, then I will write uh, the path to the file, which is in this case marshmallow, then I have folder, uh, then I have test, and then inside the test uh, folder we have this test.txt. Now I want to copy this file, right? And I want to copy it to the uh, pictures folder, right? So which uh, this folder is present in my home directory, right? So to do that, I'll just write uh, uh, the path to this picture folder, right? So I'll just hit enter and it just copied it. Okay, for some reason right now, it didn't ask me uh, for the confirmation, but usually it will ask you uh, for, the co for the confirmation, right? Okay. Okay, suppose you want to, you have uh, multiple files and you want to copy all of them uh, to, uh, to, a, to a, a different directory, right? Suppose I, I will create a file here. I'll just go to my pictures folder and here I have this one single file, right? I'll just create multiple files. I'll write test uh, 1.png, uh, test 5.py, uh, uh, test uh, 8. Dot uh, cpp right i have all these files right now i want to copy all of them uh, from this folder to uh, another directory right suppose i want to copy all of them uh, to uh, to this uh, public directory suppose right so what i can do is simply i'll just uh, list this and now we have uh, all of these files right with us so i can i can write cp and then I will write uh, the name of the files that I want to uh, copy, right? So this is the file I want to copy. Uh, this is the file I want to copy. Uh, let's say I want to copy these three files, right? So I want to copy them uh, to public directory, right? So I will write home, marshmallow, and then inside the marshmallow, I have a public folder. I'll just hit enter. And you can see in the public folder, we have these three files right so that is how you can copy multiple files uh, from what directory to a definite directory right okay suppose if you want to uh, modify a file right so before modifying the file you want to create a backup for that file right so to do that you can use a, a flag called backup suppose you want to create a backup for this test 5.py file right so i'll just go ahead and use back uh, flag cp dash backup and we'll write a file name which in this case is test5 right uh, okay we'll just remove this I'll just hit enter uh, okay I guess we had to write uh, two dashes here we'll just test this backup and then we have test5.3.1 right I'll just hit uh, enter Okay, so what it's telling me is that uh, I did not give destination file. 
whenever you create a backup, you have to give uh, the destination a file where you want to store that backup, right? So in this case, we'll just give it a, a directory. We'll just tell it to store it on home, right? So in this case, is Marshmallow. Let's hit enter. Okay, so now we'll go to our home directory and now we'll just list it. And here you can see we have this test5.py, which is a backup of this test.py in the public directory, right? So uh, I'll just go ahead and hit ls.l and here you can see we have this test.ty right, with, uh, with these permissions. Okay, so that is how you can use your CP command to copy something from one directory to another directory and we saw multiple options that we can use to enhance the capabilities of CP. In this lecture, we are going to be discussing another shell command which is called mv and this mv uh, refers to move. So this command helps us in moving files from one directory or location to another directory or location. Right, so uh, let's uh, create uh, four different files and we can do uh, that with the help of touch command and we can create files, let's call them first.txt or well, no. second.py third dot, uh, let's call it png and fourth uh, dot, uh, let's call it uh, PNG as well. I'll just hit enter and here we have four different files with us, right? Okay, okay, so uh, let's say that I want to move this first.txt file from this files folder to this folder one directory, right? So we can do that with the help of uh, mv uh, command. Let's write mv and then we have to write the file name that you want to move, which in this case is first.txt and then the, uh, the path to the directory where we want to move that file. Uh, which in this case would be home, uh, marshmallow, and then we'll go to desk, desktop, and then we'll go to files folder on desktop, and then we will go to folder one uh, directory in this files folder. Okay, so here we want to move this file. I'll just hit enter, and here you can see that the first.txt file has been disappeared from here, and if I just open up this directory, we have first.txt file here. Right, so that's how you can move your file from one directory to another directory. Okay, so now you move your file from current working directory. I mean, if I just go ahead and write pwd, I am in files folder, right? And the file was also present in files folder, right? So I moved from current directory to another directory, right? But there's an, uh, another way in which you can move files from different directory uh, as compared to your current working direc directory to another different directory. What I mean to say is you can move a file from uh, any other location uh, uh, in the system to any other location in the system, right? So to do that, uh, let's say I want to uh, move this first.txt file to this home directory, right? So I'll just uh, go there and let's just open up my terminal. So uh, right now you know that I am in files uh, directory. I'm not in folder one directory, right? So we want to uh, move the file from folder one directory. So all I have to do is write mv and then path to the file uh, where this first.txt uh, is present, right? So for that I'll write home, uh, marshmallow, then we will have desktop and inside desktop we have files folder and inside the files folder we have this folder one and in the folder one we have that file, right? Uh, which is called first.txt, uh, right? Now we want to move this file to another uh, uh, location which in this case is home directory and it is defined by home slash marshmallow and I'll just hit add and here you can see that the file has been disappeared from here and if I just open up my home directory I have a first.txt file here so that is how you can move a file from different location to another different location uh, being uh, in a separate uh, location or in, in, in a different location yourself okay so uh, that's how easy it is Okay, now let's say I want to move all of this uh, from this files directory to this folder one directory. And uh, there's a very easy way that you can do that. Let's just go ahead and hit ls command to list all the content uh, and see them in our terminal. So we want to copy all of these three files and we want to copy them uh, to this folder one directory, right? 
So whenever we talk about everything in uh, in, in bash terminal or shell com uh, in terms of shell commands or or in any coding language uh, for that matter, uh, we think of uh, something called static, right? So what we will write is mv static, which defines everything, and then we we will say that move everything. Uh, from this current directory to the destination directory, which in this case will be home, marshmallow, uh, desktop, and then uh, it will be files, and then it, it will be folder one directory. I'll just hit enter, and here you can see that everything from this directory it has been moved to this folder one directory, right? So let's just open up the terminal, and here it's telling us that you cannot move folder one to subdirectory of itself, right? I mean. Obviously, you cannot move a folder in itself, right? So that's uh, that's why it's it gave me this error in case of folder one, right? But uh, any other file, it has it moved to that folder one directory. Okay, so that's how you can use your uh, uh, static flag uh, to move all of uh, all of the content in one go from one directory to another another directory. Moving forward, we have another flag which is called dash u flag. Now what it actually does is that suppose you have two different folders and inside two different folders you have uh, two files uh, and their names are identical. Now if you try to move uh, one file from uh, one directory to another directory, it is it is going to be overwriting uh, uh, the file in the second directory, right? But there is a way in, in which we can avoid that and dash u flag helps us uh, in doing that. So first of all, what I'll do, I'll simply just go ahead and open up this folder and I will copy this file. And after that, I will paste this file here. Okay. So now we have fourth.png in this folder as well and uh, fourth.png in this uh, folder as well, right? Okay. So let's just go ahead and clear this. Okay. So what we have to do is let's write mv. And then we will write uh, dash u, and then we will write the name of the folder in which we are, uh, or from which we want to copy all the content. Let's uh, paste this, and then we write slash, and then we will tell that select everything from this folder and move it to your files. Right? Uh, or let's just uh, give the path. Oh, I mean. In. Sorry, I had to give the path. I mistakenly uh, pressed enter button. So I'll write marshmallow, then I will write uh, desktop, and then I will write files. I'll just hit enter. Okay, so uh, the reason it gave me an error because I did not give the entire path to this folder. Uh, let's just go to and give the entire path, and that is slash home slash marshmallow slash desktop and then slash files and then folder now it end up right so here you can see we have uh, uh, we have copied uh, let's just open, open up this folder as well okay so before we had fourth dot png here and then we also had these two files here right so what actually happened is uh, your command moved these two files, uh, but it didn't move this uh, third file, which is called 4.png. Because if it moved this file as well, then this file will be overridden, right? So that's how you can use your uh, dash u flag uh, to prevent overwriting while moving a file to another uh, folder where uh, we have uh, the same file with the exact identical name. So that's how you can use your mv command to uh, play around with your systems and directories. In this lecture, we are going to be learning that how we can create uh, multiple users for the support building system. Right now, we only have one user. If I just go ahead and type out echo dollar user here, you will see that uh, we only have one user, which is called Marshmallow, right? Now this marshmallow user is it is the user with which we log into this operating system, and it has all the super user privileges at this moment, right? Uh, but suppose that uh, this laptop uh, belonged to a school or a lab, right? In that case, we had to create uh, a, a new user for this laptop. 
so the one user will be uh, for administrative uh, tasks and the other user will be for students that they will use right uh, so in that case we will have to create a user which will not have uh, all the uh, pseudo privileges right so in this lecture we will learn that how can we uh, create a new user for that and uh, it's very easy to use right so all we have to do is write add user and then we will write the username let's call it uh, batman and let's keep it uh, a little funnier right so uh, if i just go ahead and uh, enter this command it it gave me an error i mean it, it told me that you can add user only as if you are root right so that way it's asking you to verify if you are super user right so all you have to do is write sudo so in the previous lectures we discussed that what sudo is right su, su means super and uh, do means i mean do something so it's telling me that whatever i'm going to do i'm doing this as a super user right so super user add user and then we'll write batman right so it's asking me to enter the password to verify if i'm a, uh, if i have all the super user privileges or not or it's trying to verify that if uh, i am logged in as as a root right so i'll just uh, enter the password and hit enter and it's just uh, uh, processing everything and now it's asking me to set up a new password for this new user so i'll just keep it very simple i'll create a one two three four five six seven eight right i'll hit enter and it's just uh, i mean it told me that it's too simple right so right now we don't have to worry about it i'll just write uh, or rewrite the same password one two three four five six seven eight okay so a uh, password has been uh set and now it's asking me to uh enter the full name uh let's call it uh steve hoffman okay uh, all the fictional names that we have we're we gonna use them i'll just hit enter a uh, room number if there is these are absolutely optional uh, information uh, you do not have to enter them then you can just simply enter it and it will just pass i just enter it work phone is 0001114444 and 3456 i'll hit enter home is 1234456 uh, 6789 okay i'll hit enter and there's nothing to be entered then i'll just enter there to uh, you know skip that part and now it's asking me that if all the information is correct i'll hit y and then i'll, I'll hit enter right so right now our user has been created so if you just go to your settings and in the settings uh, if you just uh, go here and search for user I mean, it's already open here, but I'm just showing you that how you can open it. Go to this users. Okay, you will see that one account is this Muhammad Talha, which is my original account uh, or root account or super user account or administrative account. These are all the names of a single thing, right? And this is another uh, account that we just created, which was named as Steve Hoffman, right? So right now you can see it doesn't have all the administrator privileges, right? So it's just a simple uh, account with uh, no super user privileges that a student can use right but uh, what if we, we want to give uh, this uh, user uh, administrative pr privileges right so for that we'll just open up this this terminal again and let's just close this for now and all we have to do is first of all just uh, let's just check that what uh, group this new user uh, belong to right so we name that user batman so here you can see by default uh, when you will create a new user it will belong to its own group right so you can see the batman call him batman so that user uh, this is the user it belongs to its own group right uh, and right now it will not have any uh, pseudo privileges right uh, now if you want to give them uh, uh, super user privileges you have to add this batman to a root group or to super users group right so for that what you can do is you can write user mode you can you are changing the mode of the user and you are uh, changing its group to sudo right so sudo again super user and then drive again 
uh, you will write in the name of the user that you are trying to uh, give administrative privileges to. So I'll just hit enter. Okay, so here uh, we made a little mistake. We uh, gave this uh, flag raw in the wrong way. Uh, all we have to do is just change this. Uh, we have to write dash e g, right? I just hit enter. Okay, so we have to uh, run this uh, again. You can see that this user mode. Uh, I mean, it's uh, telling us that permission is denied. So the reason is we have to uh, run this command as a super user, right? So just like we did uh, above uh, while creating this new user, we again have to write sudo here, right? So now it should give uh, this Batman new user administrative privileges. Okay, so now we uh, we are not seeing any kind of error, which means. Uh, we have successfully given all the administrative privileges to this Batman user. Now let's just go ahead and again check the group of this Batman. And here you can see right now this Batman is, belongs to this pseudo group as well. So that means it's a super user now, right? So if we just uh, log, in, log off to this uh, account right now and then again log in uh, to this uh, Batman user's account or this Steve Hoffman's user account, uh, and you're you're gonna have all the administrative privileges. I just log off to this uh, account. I just hit click here, and I will log out. Log out. Okay, so now here you can see before we only had this Muhammad Talha account, right? But now we have this Steve Hawkman's account. I'll just click here, and I will enter the password, which was uh, the very simple password: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll just hit enter. And it should log into this uh, account. Okay, so now here you can see this is the uh, this is the main page of your new account. And just like when we installed Ubuntu for the first time, it's exactly like this, right? So we can uh, work with this display. Uh, we can make it a little bigger. All we have to do is just go to the settings. So here we have uh, our settings, right? All we have to do is just uh, type here display. We'll type display and go to this screen display tab. And here we will uh, click on this uh, uh, drop down menu. And then according to our screen's resolution, we will select uh, the compatible resolution. I'll just click here and I will hit apply. And here you can see uh, the display is again, uh, I mean, completely it's no longer that uh, small window, right? So that's how you can uh, work with this. And if I just close this, I'll uh, just click next here. This is the, I mean, you have set up a new user, right? So it's uh, setting up all the settings again, just like it did uh, for the Ubuntu when we installed it for the first time, right? I'll just hit done here. Uh, I'll just click close and now here you can see we don't have uh, that uh, previous wallpaper here I mean it, it's the default uh, wallpaper for Ubuntu and we don't have all the files or folders that we had on this de desktop as well right because all of that was in uh, another user's account right and this is a whole new other user right so we'll just go ahead and test that if this account has any super uh, user privileges or not I just uh, look for terminal so everything is uh, set back uh, to default as it should be when we install Ubuntu for the first time right even this terminal uh, because we uh, you know changed the theme of this terminal as well in our super user right uh, but right now it's not that it's it's uh, the default theme of the terminal uh, which comes built in in your Ubuntu right and we know that we made our uh, user called Batman. So we have this Batman, right? Okay, so let's just see if our uh, uh, terminal or this account has super user privileges or not. What we will do, we will simply just go ahead and write sudo uh, apt install uh, vlc. Let's just install vlc. And then we will write uh, password here. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I entered the password for uh, super user, the original user, right? I'll just enter the password for this user. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. 
Right. So it didn't show any error and it's it just started to process, right? So that means now this user has all the super user privileges, right? It uh, used sudo to install VLC in this account, right? So this user right now has all the sudo privileges. I'll just abort this and uh, I'll just clear this, right? So in this uh, video, we learned that how we can create a new new user in your Ubuntu operating system. And we also learned that how we can give that new user super user privileges. In the previous lecture, we learned that how we can uh, create a new user uh, for multiple users in this uh, multi operating system. And in this lecture, we will uh, learn that how we can delete a user that is already present in uh, your uh, Ubuntu operating system, right? So first of all, uh, before deleting or removing uh, uh, an Ubuntu user account, we can list uh, currently existing accounts, right? The users are stored in the slash etc. Uh, slash password uh, where the first column is the user account name and we can list the existing users account with the cat command uh, and uh, let's just go ahead and write this cat and then we will just go to this etc and then we'll go to this password right so here we have all the existing accounts right i'll just uh, maximize this and here at the end you can see we have this backman Right, so here you can see uh, we know what kind of uh, uh, users do we have, and in this list we have this Batman user that we just created in the previous lecture, and here we can see we have uh, home slash Batman uh, home directory as well, right? And its uh, uh, bash terminal is installed in this bin slash bash. Okay, so I'll just uh, clear this, and to uh, uh, now we know what is the username of that user that we want to delete, right? Uh, so now all we have to do is write sudo because uh, we want to delete the user as a super user and then we will write del user I mean previously we used and user uh, to create a user right and now we will use del user to remove a user right and after that we'll write batman which was the username of that uh, account that we want to delete and after that I'll, what I'll do I'll just go ahead and hit enter and of course it's going to ask me to write the password I'll just enter the password here Okay, so now here you can see that uh, it's done and your user has been deleted. But you have to remember that del user uh, command it does not delete uh, the user account home directory by default. Right, so in order to delete the user account home directory, uh, we have to use a flag called uh, dash dash remove dash home, right? And what we can do is uh, we'll just simply go ahead and reuse this command. Uh, but the only difference will be we will use a flag here. We will write uh, remove dash uh, home. And what it will do, it will uh, delete the home directory. I mean, we just uh, saw when we use that cat command uh, that the home directory was this, right? Batman. So uh, with this command, uh, with this command, we will delete this home directory that was generated for this uh, Batman user. So I'll just hit enter and it's, it told me that this uh, Batman uh, home directory is uh, does not exist at this moment. Okay, so that is how you can delete your user. We'll just go to the settings to verify if the user has been deleted. We'll just open up uh, these, these settings and just go to this uh, user and then go to this users. And here we have this uh, user account, right? So now you can see that that Steve Hoffman account has been deleted and we only have this one account which is uh, named as Muhammad Tangha. So that is how you can uh, delete uh, a user account from your Ubuntu operating system. In this lecture, we will uh, learn about uh, three uh, more shell commands. The first one uh, is less, uh, the second one is what is, and the third one is which. So we'll see that what these commands actually do in a Linux operating system. Uh, so suppose uh, that you have a text file uh, that has very huge text in it, right? Uh, so here I have uh, created this uh, file.txt uh, on this my desktop. And if I just open up this file, uh, so here you can see it has more than 10,000 lines, right? So, I mean, it has around 11,012 lines, right? 
So this is a very huge uh, text file. So if you will just go ahead uh, and go to desktop and if you will use cat uh, command to uh, view this uh, file uh, file.txt uh, you can uh, see the content of this file but if you just scroll up uh, I mean uh, it's it, this is not the start of the file right uh, so all the content above this uh, passage that is just disappeared right because uh, because your terminal cannot show the entire content right uh, so to, to solve this issue uh, we use less command so what this less command actually does is it lets you view your code content of your text file inside your terminal, but it shows you in such a way that uh, you can think of it as pages of text, right? So you can go up and down, forward and backwards, right? And then you can view the entire uh, text of your text file in a very organized way, right? So if, if I'll just go ahead and use this less command here, first of all, let's just go ahead and maximize this, right? Okay, so if I just go ahead and write less, and then I will write this file dot txt. Oh, sorry, txt. So now here you can see uh, it started from the very beginning of the file, right? And now we have uh, this option here. You can use your uh, down uh, arrow from your keyboard, go downwards on this file, and read the content step by step. If you want to go upward. You can use the upper key as well and then you can go to the very beginning of the text uh, right so i mean that this is a very organized way to, to see a text file in your terminal right now just like a cat command your beginning of the text is not disappeared you can always access this uh, as well if you want to go to the end of this file you can just uh, keep on scrolling down using that uh, down keyword right so that's how you can use uh, your less command uh, so, uh, we'll just uh, hit Q to exit that text file and I'll just uh, clear this. Okay, I'll just clear this. And now I uh, will uh, see that what is, what is command, right? So, uh, just like it name suggests, it lets you know everything about, uh, about something that what uh, that command or that software actually do. So uh, let's say, uh, suppose if I want to know that what cat command does, right? So I will just simply write, what is cat? So it just told you that your cat command uh, helps you concatenate files and it helps you uh, in printing on the standard output. Uh, let's say I want to know that what ls command does. So I can simply write, what is ls, right? So in a simple, in a one single line, it will tell me that it lists directory contents, right? And we know that uh, what ls does we uh, saw uh, in the previous lectures as well uh, suppose uh, we want to know that what is man does so it uh, i mean this is uh, uh, this these are the uh, tasks that your man command uh, will do uh, let's say uh, that what is a firefox i'll just hit enter so it, it told you that it, it is a free and open source uh, web browser from what is Mo mozilla right so you know, what is command just like it names suggest it lets you know that uh, what a certain command or a software does in the very short single line okay so now comes uh, which command right so uh, whenever you uh, type command which and then let's say if you write uh, ls here so it will let you know that where the executable name for this uh, ls command has been saved. If I just hit enter, so it told you that this ls command uh, is saved here in uh, this user bin and ls. So what the uh, executable name actually means, right? So whenever you write this ls command, let's say if you hit enter, now why why all of this this content has appeared here? because you executed this ls command right so because you executed this ls command that means it, it, it's ex executable and it's saved somewhere in your system right and this is the path where your ls has been saved and that is uh with the help of which command you can know that where your ls command has been saved you can simply just uh, try this for firefox as well and it told you that your firefox is uh, in user slash wind slash firefox 
right so that means you can check it for commands as well and you can also check it for softwares as well right so that is the purpose of a which command you can know that where the executable name of your command or software has been saved in inside your uh, inside your uh, system right uh, and it will uh, sometimes it will help you in recognizing if your software has been installed or not right or it it will also uh, help you in finding out that which version of the software has been uh, uh, has been installed in your system or, or not uh, for example if you install anaconda right so if, if you will install different versions of anaconda or if you will install different versions of cuda uh, that is a driver for gpu then uh, there will be different uh, uh, paths for uh, for those different versions right uh, let's say uh, you can you can use a flag called uh, flag a and uh, let's say we will check for touch so if you just check which touch without this flag it will give you only this path right but if you will uh, use this dash a flag then it will give you all the possible paths for all the versions of a touch right so right now it's same right uh, here we have bin slash touch here we also have bin slash touch right uh, but in case let's say you have installed uh, different versions of PyTorch or different versions of anaconda then when you will use this uh, this flag that all the directories uh, where different versions of that CUDA or PyTorch has been installed they will be listed here so that's how you can use a which command in your robot operating system so in this lecture we learned that how we can use less command what is command and which command okay in this lecture we are going to be learning about another shell command which is called cat right so if you want to know that what this cat command actually does all you have to do is just go ahead and write what is and then you will write the name of the command which is cat and it will tell you that this uh, cat command first of all it uh, it can concatenate files and it can also display uh, its content, right? So uh, that is the basic uh, use of this cat. But it, uh, other than this, your cat command can also help you in creating files as well. So I'll just uh, go ahead and clear this prompt here. And on the left hand side, you can see that our cat folder has been created uh, where we will visualize all the changes, right? And here you can see we are also in the desktop cat folder, right? So uh, our terminal and our GUI both are in the same directory. So first of all, we'll use cat command to create a file, right? So you can uh, write cat and then you will write this single greater than sign. And after that, without any space, you will write the name of the file that you want to create. In this case, the, the file name will be test1.txt, right? So if I just hit enter, here you can see the file has been created, right? But now we did not get our terminal uh, problem back, right? It's still uh, blinking here. So uh, the reason is that right now your file is open with the help of this cat and you can add any content inside it as well. So we'll just go ahead and write, this is a first file, right? And after that, we'll just hit Control D to close this file. Okay, so now you can see uh, that the file uh, has been uh, closed. Uh, if if I just go ahead and open the open up this file, you can see that uh, the line that we entered in the terminal is actually saved in this file, which is this is a first file. You can also create a second file with the same technique. All you have to do is just go ahead and write different name and uh, hit enter, and here you can write this is a second file. Right, and then you again you will hit Control D. Right, so if we just open up this file, so here you can see it says this is a second file, right? Okay, so that's how you can create uh, files with the help of your cat command. Okay, suppose if I want to change my file, right? Uh, let's say if I just go to my test1.txt file, if I just hit enter again, right? And if I'll just open up this file now, here you can see everything has been removed from this test1.txt file because we used cat command to update that file again, right? So if you do that, all of the previous content in the same file will be deleted and it will ask you to add new content inside it. All right, so I'll just go ahead and write this is the second version of 
uh, first for it. Right? So I'll just hit control D and uh, the file is closed. If I just close this file and open up this again, here you can see uh, this new input uh, is saved in this file. Right? So that's how you can update uh, the content of your file as well with the help of uh, your cat command. Okay, so uh, just like we mentioned at the start of this video, this cat command uh, actually does concatenation between the uh, two files. So what it really means is you can literally go ahead and add the content of this second file to the content of this uh, first file, which means uh, this first file will contain the content of both of these uh, files, right? And vice versa, it, it, will, it can happen for the second file as well. So let's just go ahead and use this uh, cat command to do that. First of all, we will write cat and then we will write the first uh, file's name, which in this case is test1. And then we will write this double uh, greater than sign, right? So, uh, remember before we use single greater than sign. Now we have double greater than sign. And then we will write, uh, first of all, just complete the file name with this, with its extension. It's very important. And then you will write the name of the second file, which is test2.txt. We'll just hit enter. And now uh, we can uh, uh, visualize the content of both files. Let's just uh, visualize them uh, one by one, right? This is the, the uh, first file and this is second file. So here you can see the content of this second file is updated. First it was only this is second file. But now it also has the content of first file, which is this is the second version of first file, right? So you can uh, verify it from here as well. So that's how you can concatenate your uh, files with the help of uh, uh, CAD command, right? Okay, uh, so suppose you want to uh, concatenate the content of uh, multiple files and you want to write the final output into a new file and that file is not uh, created yet. You can create it in a single step. So you can do that uh, with the help of this. Uh, first of all, let's just go ahead and uh, remove this one right this part of uh, a content from second file so for that i'll just open up my test2.txt with this single greater than sign and i will write this is a second file right i just hit ctrl d and then i will uh, visualize the content of this uh, file just to verify uh, here you can see that uh, now we have this is the second file content in this second file, right? Okay So now what we want is we want to concatenate the content of these two files and create a third file and save uh, That final content in that uh, third file, right? So to do that we can do is cat test 1.txt 1.txt test uh, Two dot txt and then you will use these double uh, uh, greater than sign and then you will write the name of the final or the third file that you want to create which in this case will be test 3 dot txt right I'll just hit enter and here you can see test 3 dot txt has been uh, created I'll just open up this file and here you can see uh, first we have this is the second uh, version of first file so this is the content of first file and after that we have this is a second file this is the content of second file so that's how you can concatenate the content of multiple files into a new file so in this lecture uh, you learned that what is a cat command and you learned that how we can use that cat command to concatenate multiple files in this lecture we are going to be learning three more shell commands and the first one is called top uh, the second one is called kill and the third one is called free right so we will see that uh, one by one that what these commands actually do so uh, when we talk about windows operating system uh, if you want to see all the applications running and you want to see the performance you go to task manager right so in the case of linux uh, the uh, what your task manager does in windows top command does in linux right 
so let's just go ahead and write top here and hit enter so here you can see we have all the applications uh, or commands that are running and we have uh, all the information associated with them right so for example here we have uh, uh, let's say we have this uh, this norm uh, shell uh, it's uh, our unique id is 1810 and marshmallow user is using it and it's taking 6.9% of the CPU and 4.5% of the memory, right? So this is all the information that we are getting for all the uh, softwares uh, or applications or commands that are running in all the Linux right now. And here you can see, if you pay attention here on this time, uh, then you will know that this refresh rate of this table is uh, done uh, every three seconds, right? So this refresh, uh, I mean, after three seconds, this table gets updated, right? So uh, that's how you can use your top command to uh, see the performance of uh, each and every uh, single application or command, and you will monitor that uh, uh, how much memory or CPU uh, they are actually uh, using and uh, which user is is using that service, right? So uh, here you can see that on the left hand side we have this Chrome open up, right? So let's say we want to and this right so we have uh, two different instances of chrome right uh, uh one's id is 6216 and the second id is 2466 right uh so because this uh, table is constantly updating so it, these uh softwares uh, will go up and down in that table right okay so suppose uh, if you want to uh, i mean close this chrome right so for that we have an option for this top uh, uh, for this top uh, command uh, and that option is K now uh, that K option kills every single service that you uh, ask it to do right uh, so what we can do is uh, we can just click on this terminal and all we have to do is just uh, go ahead and uh, hit uh, hit K right uh, and now we will write uh, the uh, unique IDs of the services that you want to close, right? So we want to close uh, Chrome, and Chrome's uh, Chrome has three instances right right now, right? So we can uh, close them. The f one uh, ID is twenty four ninety nine. Uh, the other is forty two sixty four, and the other is forty two eighty nine. So we can just simply go ahead and write uh, this uh, twenty four ninety nine uh, ID here, and hit enter so again just go ahead and hit enter right so that instant has been uh, deleted now and here you can see that the chrome has been closed on the left hand side as well right so that's how you can uh, use k option to kill any service um, inside a uh, top command right okay so here you can see i mentioned earlier as well that this table is being updated every three seconds Let's say you want this table to be updated every five seconds, right? So you can use D. Just click anywhere in the terminal and hit D. And here you can change the delay time uh, from three to uh, any number of uh, seconds that you want. Let's say I want to update this uh, uh, for five seconds, right? So I'll just uh, write this five and I will hit enter, right? So now instead of three seconds, it will uh, get updated every five seconds right so after 33 it went to 38 right so 38 minus 33 we have five seconds so that's how you can use your uh, top command and to exit this table all you have to do is just uh, hit q right so it will get outside of this table okay so i'll just go ahead and clear this prompt okay now we have uh, another command which is called kill right uh, and just like its uh, name suggests, it uh, helps us in killing uh, or closing applications or commands, right? So uh, what we can do is let's just go ahead and open up this um, Mozilla Firefox, right? Okay, so we have this Mozilla Firefox open up, right? Uh, so we can use this kill command to close this Mozilla Firefox, right? So uh, before using this kill command, we actually need top command, right? Because we need uh, its a uh, unique ID, uh, which we will use to uh, kill this uh, Mozilla Firefox, right? So we'll just go ahead and hit uh, top command and 
uh, here we have to look for uh, the Mozilla Firefox, right? Uh, so uh, here it is, the Firefox, right? So its ID is 9195, right? So we can just simply go ahead and hit Q because now we have its ID and then we'll just uh, clear uh, this uh, terminal and now we will use Kelp and we will write the ID of this Mozilla Firefox which is 9195 and I'll hit enter and here you can see that Mozilla Firefox has been uh, closed right okay so suppose this uh, service or an application or software is running and uh, you cannot close it right I mean you, you are not able to close it because it's uh, let's say it's hang right uh, so you can forcefully close it as well and all you have to do is uh, write kill and then uh, use this kill flag and then you will write the ID of that uh, that service right and it will just close it right so that's how you can use your kill command next coming up we have a third command which is called free command right so I'll just go ahead and clear uh, this uh, terminal. Okay, so when we talk about free command, it, it tells you uh, about occupied and C physical and swap memory. So I'll just go ahead and hit enter. And here you can see it's uh, giving me that this is memory and this is swap. Right, so total I have this much memory. This is used and this is freed and this is shared and this is cache and this is available. But we cannot understand it. I mean, it's not human uh, humanly uh, readable, right? So to make it uh, human uh, readable, what we can do is we can write uh, free. And then we can write uh, flag edge, right? So now it's uh, readable, right? I mean, it's telling us that it's 5.8 gigabytes. GI is for gigabytes. Uh, and... Um, then we have this 60 mi and 60 mi is for megabytes and similarly ki will be for the kilobytes right so now we can read this right so that is how you can use your free command uh, to see that uh, how much of your memory is available and how much of your swap memory is available or be used right in this lecture, we are going to learn that how we can install pip uh, package manager inside our Ubuntu operating system. Uh, now, uh, pip is just like I said, it's a package manager and it mostly supports all the packages that your Python programming language use, right? So Python is a programming language. It's the most uh, popular language uh, in the entire world. It is used for almost all the domains of life it's it's used in web development uh, android development uh, and then it, it, it all it, it is also used in um, desktop uh, app development uh, we can also use it in ai and machine learning applications as well uh, we can also use it in iot python is a programming language that we can use in any uh, type or in any stream of life right uh, so, uh, when we are working with Python, we have to uh, work with the different packages that this programming language supports, right? And pip is a package manager that provides us all the packages that are compatible with Python, right? So, it's very easy to install uh, that package manager. All you have to do is write sudo apt install and then you have to write Python 3. Now, remember, when we talk about Python, there are two versions. First, uh, it was Python 2. Uh, which is uh, almost uh, very old now and uh, uh, it it doesn't have any support officially uh, and now we have Python 3 right so when we are talking about Python in Linux then we have to uh, define that which uh, version of Python we are talking about right so for that we have to write this Python 3 right uh, we can't uh, simply write Python in Windows you can uh, simply just write Python without this three, right? But in Ubuntu or Linux, uh, you cannot do that. So we will write sudo apt install Python three, and then we will write pip, right? And we'll just hit enter, and we'll just go ahead and enter the password. And here you can see that your pip uh, is beginning uh, to download and install. Uh, so remember that the newer version of Ubuntu uh, operating system comes uh, with built-in pip and Python, right? Uh, so, I mean, uh, you can simply just verify and check that if your system supports pip uh, as a built-in 
package manager or not. If not, then you can just follow these steps and install it in very uh, easy steps. Okay, so here you can see that it told me that Python 3 pip is already the newest version, right? So because I am using Ubuntu's newer version, right? So by pip and Python both comes built in in this Ubuntu operating system. So that is why it did not install anything. If you want to see that if a pip is installed in your system, then you can use pip 3. Again, 3 is for same reason because we have uh, installed this pip for Python 3, right? So for that, we also uh, call this pip with pip 3. Then we'll use this version flag to see if our pip has been installed. I'll just hit enter and here you can see we have this uh, pip 22.0.2 and it is for Python 3.10. So that's how you can install pip package manager in your Ubuntu operating system. Now, if you want to see that how we can install uh, different packages using pip, then you can simply do this. You can write pip 3 install. Uh, let's say I want to install numpy package, right? So I'll just write this numpy and I'll hit enter. And this pip will download and install this numpy automatically, right? So it told me that numpy is already present. So, I mean, that's why it did not download it, but it is uh, the, this simple syntax that you can follow to install any package that is present in pip package manager. In this video, we are going to install Python in our Ubuntu operating system. So keep in mind that if you have installed your Ubuntu's new version, then Python is probably going to be already installed in it. But if you do not have Python, first of all, you can check it with the help of this command. Just simply go ahead and write Python 3 dash dash version. So remember, whenever you will use Python in Ubuntu, you always have to write Python 3, right? Uh, it lets your Ubuntu operating system know that uh, you are going to interact with Python, uh, Python's version 3, right? Uh, if you don't know that when Python came, first we had uh, Python's 2 version, right? 2.1, 2.2, 2.7, right? So, but then Python evolved and now we have Python's third version, right? So your terminal has to recognize it, right? So if you want to use Python 3, then you have to, I mean, mention it explicitly. So that's why I just go ahead and write Python 3 dash dash version and just hit enter, right? So here you can see I have Python 3.10.6 installed in my Ubuntu operating system. But if this command gives you an error, then uh, just understand that Python is not installed and you can install it uh, with very simple command and that is sudo apt install python3, right? Just go ahead and hit enter and just enter the password and it should install, right? So here you can see uh, it did not give me any error and here you can see it told me that 0 to upgrade, 0 to newly install, 0 to remove, right? And you can see that it is giving me the message that Python is already the newest version, right? Uh, so that means Python is already already installed. But in your case, uh, if Python is not installed, then it will just go ahead and, uh, you know, start downloading and start uh, to get installed in your system. So that's how you can install Python uh, in Ubuntu operating system. Okay, so now that we have uh, Python installed in our Ubuntu's operating system, we can just go ahead and simply test its uh, functionality to see that if uh, it is working fine or if our terminal or Ubuntu is uh, recognizing it, right? So for that, all you have to do is just go ahead and write Python 3. And here you can see it started Python shell, right? So here you can perform a couple of different tasks, uh, maybe very small uh, programs or codes that if they will work, then we know that Python is working correctly, right? So imagine that we have uh, x uh, variable, and in the x variable, we want to store 30. So I'll just go ahead and write x is equal to 30 and I'll hit enter. And then we can have x is equal to, uh, I would say, let's say 40. Uh, and I will just go ahead and hit enter. And then let's just take a variable z. And inside uh, this variable z, we will uh, store the value of x plus y, right? So x plus y equals to z. And then we can just go ahead and write uh, print z to print the value that we get after uh, doing this addition, right? So if I just go ahead and hit enter, and here you can see we have this uh, 70 as an answer, right? So that's how you can see 
uh, that Python is uh, not only installed, but it's working uh, absolutely fine. Now, in the next lecture, we will go ahead and install an IDE that will help us uh, in working with Python programming language. In this video, we are going to install Visual Studio Code, uh, which is a Microsoft's uh, IDE, uh, which helps us in working on different uh, programming languages, including C++, Python, Java, and other languages like JavaScript, CSS, HTML. So you can uh, possibly work on uh, any kind of programming language on the same IDE or platform. And installing it is very, very easy. So without further ado, let's just uh, go uh, to uh, your Chrome or any of the browser that you prefer. Just go ahead uh, to your Google and here search for VS Code Download. And just click on this very first link. Now here you can see we have uh, these three types of packages. This one is for Windows operating system. This is for a Mac operating system. And this in between we have uh, for Debian based systems like Linux and Ubuntu, Kali Linux, Parrot OS, uh, you know, all the systems that are, uh, you know, based on Linux environment. So just go ahead and click on this .deb package. And it should uh, start to download very soon. So here you can see the downloading has been installed. We'll just uh, go ahead and fast forward to the time where uh, this package will be completely downloaded. So we uh, save the time. Okay, so here you can see we have successfully downloaded the package. So we can just simply click here to show in the folder to see that where the package is uh, currently downloaded. So we have this package downloaded into uh, the downloads folder, right? So all you have to do is just open up the terminal and just navigate to that folder where we have downloaded the package and which is downloads folder. So I'll just go to my downloads folder and I'll just hit LS and here we have this VVS codes package, right? So all we have to do is just write sudo d package hyphen i and then we will write the name of the file. All right, so I'll just copy it and I'll just paste it here. And I will hit enter and it's going to ask me the password. I'll just go ahead and enter the password. So, of course, it's going to take a couple of seconds based on your laptops or computers processing speed. But I'll just uh, fast forward this from here so we save some time. So, here you can see we have successfully installed our Visual Studio code. Uh, now, if you just uh, press your uh, window button on the keyboard and go to your menu, uh, here, if you just go ahead and search for VS Code. So here you can see we have uh, this icon now, right? But you can, uh, either you can start it by clicking here or you can also start it with the help of terminal as well. All you have to do is just go ahead and write code and it should initiate your Visual Studio Code in your Ubuntu operating system. Here you can see we have our Visual Studio Code opened up, right? So I'll just go ahead and maximize this window and we will set up this Visual Studio Code for Python. So first of all, what we can do is we can simply just uh, go to this icon and we'll just hit enter. So this icon uh, basically belongs to extensions. And here in the extensions, we'll just uh, search for Python. And here you can see we have this Python extension from Microsoft, right? Just go ahead and hit on this install button. And here you can see the Python extension is being installed. We'll just wait for a couple of seconds until it is installed. I'll fast forward the video. So here you can see this Python extension has been installed successfully. So all we have to do is just uh, restart our Visual Studio code. I'll just close it. And uh, we can simply type code here again to restart it. Okay, so here we have our uh, Visual Studio code. So here we have our Visual Studio code. So now what you can do is just hit Control plus tilde on your keyboard to bring this uh, terminal. And then you can hit Control plus N to start this new file, right? 
So here we can create uh, any Python program. I'll just simply go ahead and create a very simple Python program. I'll take a variable x. And inside this, uh, I will ask the user to enter a number. And for that, in Python, we use uh, input a function. And then I will write uh, enter your number. Now this will be uh, displayed to the user when the program will run. And then I will take another variable uh, and I will ask the user to enter your second number. Right? And then what I will do is I will simply add both of these uh, numbers and I will store them in variable called z. And then what I can do is simply just go ahead and print the value of z. Right? So I will just hit control plus s to save the file. Right, so we can simply save this file on desktop. So just click on this desktop and here I will name the file as uh, test.py, right? And .py shows that it is a Python file and I will save it. And here you can see the color of the text has been changed. So that means your Python has detected this code. Now what you can do is, uh, because you save this file on desktop, you have to navigate to desktop as well. Right, so in the terminal, you will just simply go to your desktop and let's just uh, hit ls to see if our test.py is present here. Right, so here we have our test.py, right? So we have our test.py here. But uh, there's a little mistake. We wanted to write y, not your, right? So I'll just save this program again. And now what I will do, I'll simply just write Python 3 because we want to execute Python file. And then after that, we will write the name of the file that we want to, uh, you know, work on. And after that, I'll just go ahead and hit enter. So I'll just pull it up so we can see it more clearly. Here, the program is asking the user to uh, enter the first number. I'll uh, add, let's say, 30. And the second number is going to be 20. And I will hit enter. So here we have 30, 20, right? So the reason why it did not add these two numbers is because input function takes everything in string data type, right? So to convert it into integer, uh, we can simply use this program or this uh, built-in method or function in Python, which is called int. And I will again convert this to integer as well. Now what we are doing right now is called uh, type casting in Python, right? So, but as this is not the scope of this course, so I will not get uh, too deep into this. I'll save the program and I will rerun this uh, program. I will enter the number again, 30, and then I will add 20. So here you can see now we have 50 instead of 30, 20, because this time we converted the string into integer. And after converting both of them to integer, we added them. And this time, because they were integer, so instead of just concatenated, they actually got added in each other, right? So 30 plus 20, we have 50 as an answer. So that's how you can test your Python or work on your Python program in your Ubuntu operating system with the help of Visual Studio Code IDE that is uh, supported by Microsoft. In this lecture, we are going to learn that how can we install G++ and GCC uh, compilers for C++ and C programming language. Uh, so it's very easy. All you have to do is just go ahead and write sudo apt install G++ and GCC. Hit enter. And here you can see it's telling me that your G++ is already the newest version and your GCC is already the newest version, right? So just like Python, if you want to see the version or if you want to see that uh, if both of these compilers are installed correctly or not, you can go ahead and check their versions with hyphen hyphen version flag. And uh, here you can see that G++ is 11.3.0 and GCC is also hyphen hyphen uh, version and GCC is also 11.3.0, right? So that means our uh, G++ and GCC, both compilers uh, have been installed uh, successfully on the Ubuntu operating system. And quite frankly, if you are using a new version of Ubuntu, then it, uh, it's probably uh, already installed in your operating system, right? 
Okay. So now let's just go ahead and uh, see that uh, how we can work with uh, C programs uh, with the help of this terminal and use, uh, uh, you know, GCC or G++ to compile uh, the C or uh, C++ programs respectively. So uh, first of all, let's just go ahead and create a file, right? Uh, or let's just go to desktop first. And here we will use touch to create a file and we will name it uh, C++ plus plus dot cpp. I just hit enter, and here you can see we have C++ plus plus dot cpp file, right? I'll just open it, and we will write a very simple uh, C++ plus plus program, and we will say that include io stream. Then we will write using namespace std. And then we will write int main. And inside these curly brackets, we will write the uh, C out. Hello world. And we'll close it with end line. And at the end, we will write return zero. Now the scope of this course is not C++, so I will not explain what we are doing here. I just, uh, uh, this is just a simple C++ program in which we are uh, trying to print hello world, right? So this is a, uh, you know, header file. Okay, so I'll just close this program and here you can see uh, the icon of the CPB file has been changed, right? Now it's showing me that it's a C++ file. Okay, so I just put it on the left hand side of the desktop. Okay, now what, what we want to do is we want to compile this file, right? So we can compile C++ files with C++, G++. And after that, we will write the name of the file, uh, which we want to compile. And then uh, we will uh, go ahead and hit enter. Okay, so I think that we uh, wrote the name wrong. It is IO stream, right? So just change the spellings and then we will rerun this. Okay, so there you can see we have this exit table now with us, right? So I'll again put it on the left hand side so it's more clear. Okay, so all you have to do is just write on the terminal dot slash and then the name of the execu executable file, right? So as a default, it gives you the name as a dot out, right? You can name it anything you want but right now we'll just go ahead and write as soon as we executed it we got our output which is hello world so that is how you can use g++ to work with c++ files in ubuntu in this lecture we are going to learn that how can we work with c++ programs with the help of visual studio code which is an ide by microsoft we also used this IDE in the case of Python programming language. And if you want to learn that how can we install it, uh, you can just simply head to that Python section. And here I showed that uh, how we how how can we install Visual Studio Code in Ubuntu operating system. Okay, so this is our VS Code or Visual Studio Code. I'll just maximize this window. I just like Python. We'll uh, head to this extensions tab. And I will click here, and here all you have to do is just type C++ and look for the extension by Microsoft, right? So this is the extension that we are looking for. And go ahead and install it. Of course, it's going to take a couple of minutes or second based on your internet connection. So I'll just skip the part of uh, this waiting. Okay, so here you can see that we have successfully installed C++ uh, and now all you have to do is just open up a new tab and and just uh, go to this uh, bottom, right bottom of your window and click on this uh, plain text. Uh, here you can see when you will hover on this option, uh, you will see select language mode, right? Just click here and here just to select this C++ if you want to work on C++, right? So what I'll do, I'll just uh, close this tab and I'll hit Control tilde to uh, bring this terminal. Okay, so now all we need right now is uh, just to write code and just like we did in the previous lecture, uh, we can write include, sorry, hash include 
io stream then i will write using name space std and then i will write int main and inside i will write the body uh, let's just go ahead and print hello world right so in the uh, in these quotation marks we will just write hello world and then we will just write end line and then return is zero right so all you have to do is just save it uh let's just save this on the desktop we can write it vs code dot cpb and here you can see as soon as you save this program uh, it is asking you to uh, install a, a, an extension for C++, right? So if if this message shows, then just go ahead and install it. If it doesn't, then just, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, compile your program, right? So uh, we installed C++ package, but this is another uh, extension, uh, which is called Seeing C++ Extension Pack by Microsoft. Uh, it seemed to be official. Uh, that our VS code will use so we'll just wait for it to install okay so as you can see uh, it's installed we can simply just go back uh, go to our tab where we were working and here you, you after saving this file you will see this play button here right so just go ahead and click in on it right uh, just select your uh, you know g++ build debug active file and here you can see it's uh, started to compile right Okay, so here you can see we have uh, our output hello world with us. So that's how you can use your C++ programming with the VS Code in Ubuntu. In this video, we are going to learn that how can we use make and create make files to work with C++ programmers. So the very first thing that we need to understand is the purpose of creating make files. Uh, so right now we only have uh, two C++ files, we have main.cpp and we have message.cpp and this is the header file that is going to be used in message.cpp, right? So at the moment we only have these two uh, cpp files and if we want to compile uh, these files, all we have to do is uh, just write g++ and then we will write main.cpp then message.cpp then we will use this uh, hyphen o flag to create the output uh, basically we use this flag to uh, name uh, the executable file uh, to our desires for example if i want to name the executable file as output so all we have to do is this write output here now if I, i'll just hit enter so here you can see uh, the executable file has been created and uh, if i just go ahead and execute this file and here you can see we have our output output which is called make file example right so this is the most simple way to compile files but imagine that you have uh, more than 100 more than 1000 files or 2000 files uh, created with c++ right so i mean obviously you cannot write uh, the names of all the files here right you cannot simply write name 1000 names 2000 names of the files to compile them so that's where your make file comes in we use make files to automate the compilation process and the other benefit that we get from make files is uh, that make file detects the files in which we have uh, made any changes and it only compiles th those files instead of compiling all the files from scratch right so uh, before we just go ahead and uh, try to make uh, files uh, first of all i'll just open up the cpp files to uh, show you the program that i have just created it, it's not a very complicated program this is just a a uh, simple C++ program. Uh, here we have uh, main.cpp, and uh, in this message, in this program, we are only creating a message object, and from this message object, we are calling this print message uh, function, right? And in this print message function, we we, we will have our uh, message that we are going to get when we will execute our C++ program. Uh, this is the message.h file. Uh, so when you uh, call uh, this print message from your object, it checks this message.h file, right? So here we have a file guards at the start and at the end. 
the only thing they do here is uh, they let this class uh, to be to execute only once right uh, it doesn't let this class to execute over and over again so uh, here uh, from this class our function will be called which is a print function and uh, this print function is actually given in this message.ctp file right so here you can see we have this uh, a message print message function and in the uh, message function we have this output called make file example right so that is why when you execute it uh, or uh, this output executable file we got uh, an answer of make file example right if i'll just go ahead and do that again uh, output because we have already uh, created our executable file by compiling main.cpp and message.cpp if I just hit enter here, we have the output, which is make file uh, example, right? So this is a make file example. Okay, so now that we have understood the uh, program itself, we will just go ahead and create make files, right? So first of all, I'll just write touch make file. Okay, here you have to pay attention that your M will be capital and everything else will be uh, s smaller and without any spaces or underscore. Just hit enter. There is no extension to this make file, right? So here you can see we have our make file. Just open up this file. Okay, now to create this make file, uh, we have to follow a certain syntax, right? I will just write the syntax here. First of all, we will get the target. Now this is the target. Uh, in other words, this is the output that we want, right? And then here we will write the dependencies. Dependencies are the files uh, that will help us in generating this output or target, right? And then after uh, entering uh, the next line, just go ahead and press one tab. Uh, remember, this is very important because make files are uh, space sensitive. So all you have to do is just hit tab, right? And here we will write the action. So action is the command which will use these dependencies to create this target, right? So I'll just hit Control plus S, and here you can see the icon of the make file has been changed, right? Okay, so first of all, what we need is we need output, right? Because this is the executable file that we want to create after compiling all the files. Imagine that we have uh, 2000 files, right? So this is the output that we want. Okay, now uh, to get this output, uh, we need main.o and message.o right because we have this main.cpp and message.cpp and when we will compile this only then we will get this output right but here, the only difference is this is main.cpp and this is message.cpp but here we have main.o and message.o right so these are object files created by main.cpp and message.cpp when we will compile both of these files individually then only then we will uh, get our uh, main. Uh, o object file and message dot o object file right so let's just go ahead and see that how can we create these two files so to get uh, main dot o again see that i'm writing this main dot o uh, as an output because i want this as a result then i will use the dependencies to create this file and in this case uh, main dot cpp will be used right so this is a dependency which we will help us in creating this main dot o and then we will go to the next line and hit tab and here we will write that command that will help uh, us co uh, in creating main.o by using main.cpp right so i just mentioned that if you want to create this object file we have to compile main.cpp right and we know the command to compile any c++ file and that is g++ main.cpp right but what we do is we write a flag and then we define the output file name right and then our executable file uh, is created right but the only difference is we do not want executable file what we want is we want object file right so we will not use this instead we will give a hyphen c flag now what this flag actually does is uh, it compiles this main.cpp and it generates an object file uh, with dot o extension right so with this command uh, it will use main.cpp to generate this main.o object file. And the same thing will be uh, done uh, to create message.o object file. But the only difference is in this case, we will use message.cpp and message.h handle file as well, right? Now the command is exactly the same. We will use message.cpp. Okay. 
So first of all, when our make file will be executed, this command will be executed and it will use these two files to create message.o. After that, this command will be executed and it will use main.cpp to create main.o, right? And after that, what will happen is we will write G++ and we will use main.o message.o because these are the dependencies and then we will give a hyphen o flag and then output because now we want to use these two object files to create this executable file using C++, right? So that's how you can create your make file, okay? And the only uh, thing that is left is clean, right? Uh, this clean command, it does not use any dependencies and we will write a remove and static for everything and dot o which means that everything that has extension dot o with that we will also remove output executable file i'll just save this file right so now we know that uh how these commands are actually working in make file right so what i'll do i'll just go ahead and minimize this and we have this uh terminal with us first of all i'll just go ahead and clear the terminal and i will hit uh, ls right and let's just go ahead and delete this. Clear it and then put ls, right? So now we have main.cpp, make file, message.cpp, and message.h, right? Okay, so if you want to uh, compile all these files uh, to see uh, the output after getting executable file, all you have to do is just write make, right, and hit enter. And here you can see all three of the commands that we wrote, they are executed, right? And at the end, we have our output executable file. Here you can see it. And you can also go ahead and execute this executable file to see the output, right? So we have make file example as the output. So that's how you can create and use make files. Now the purpose for which we use make files is very simple. Let's just go ahead and uh, explore this. Uh, I'll just execute this make clean and, and as soon as i will hit it you will see that all the object files and the output again is deleted from this folder and we have original files right so imagine if i go ahead and change the message right in this file uh let's just go ahead and again make all the files uh, let's just hit enter Okay, so all the files are executed. We have this message.o, we have this main.o, we have this executable output, right? Uh, what I'll do, I'll just again show you in the output, we have a make file example. Okay, so now at this point, let's just go ahead and, and uh, change uh, this message.cpp. So this is the exact same example that you have a, a program compiled running, and then for some reason, if you want to add a feature, you are changing something in your one of the files in your uh, C++ files, right? So let's just go ahead and change the message here. We will write hello world. Hello world, right? Let's just go ahead and uh, save this file, right? Okay, so what we will do is we will just go ahead and, uh, and again uh, run this make command. So before uh, you saw that all three commands were executed. We compiled main.cpp, message.cpp, and then uh, using the object files, we created the output, right? But now only message.cpp file uh, has been compiled. Main.cpp file is not compiled because we only made change in this message.cpp, right? We did not make any change in main.cpp. That's why its uh, compilation is not required. The only thing we need to compile is message.cpp. And your make file detects this automatically and do all the work, right? So after uh, compiling this, now we have new message.o file, right? So uh, in order to use that message.o with main.o, uh, we uh, again use this command to create new output file, right? Now if I just go ahead and uh, execute this new output, so here you can see instead of make file example, we have new message which is called hello world. So that is why you use make files to work with C++ uh, programs uh, because they detect the update automatically and compile only those files which are updated. And it does all of this without any human involvement. It, it does that automatically. That is uh, the purpose of using make file.
In this lecture, we are going to install Code Blocks IDE for C or C++ programming. In the previous lectures, uh, I showed you that how you can install Visual Studio Code. Uh, but uh, when you are working on C or C++ and you want to use an IDE that is specially made for these programming languages, then uh, there's a very excellent option which is called Code Blocks that you can use. And it's very easy to install in Ubuntu operating system. You can simply just go uh, to their website, just write uh, code blocks on Google and it will take you to their official website and, and you can check its features and all the important details about it. But uh, we can simply just uh, skip that and install code blocks in our Ubuntu operating system. Uh, so the very first thing that we need to do is uh, update your system, right? So I will write sudo apt update. And it's a very uh, good practice to update your Ubuntu operating system before you install something. Okay, so now that everything is updated, all we have to do is just write sudo apt, sorry, sudo apt install code blocks. Right, just go ahead and type Y and hit enter. Now these are all the uh, packages that uh, will be installed after uh, we are done with this installation because these are all the packages that our core blocks uh, is going to use so it really depends on your internet connection that how much longer will it take to download and install all these packages so i'll just simply go ahead and uh, fast forward the video from here okay so here you can see that uh, our core blocks uh, has been installed just hit a uh, windows button on your keyboard and go to the uh, this uh, type to search uh, bar and type code blocks, right? So here you can see we have a code blocks IDE with us, right? So you can simply just go ahead and click on it. And here you can see that uh, we have a GCC compiler already installed here. So it detected it. So just, I mean, let it be and hit OK. OK, so this is the code blocks IDE that we are going to be using. Uh, so you can simply just go to this files and here you can uh, create new project, right? Just click here. Okay, so these are all the different types of objects that you can create. You can create JTK project, MATLAB project, uh, OpenCV project, OpenGL project. Uh, I mean, inside this uh, code blocks IDE, that's how powerful uh, it actually is. So let's just go ahead and uh, select this console applications because if you're gonna work on C or C++ as a, as a beginner, so then most probably you are going to be using console application. Just click here and hit go and just hit next. Uh, if you are going to be working on C++, then just go ahead and uh, select this language. And if you are going to be working on C, then select this. I'm going to select C++ next. Uh, this is the name. Uh, this is the test project. Right. And we will select the folder where, where we want to save this. And let's just uh, select desktop. Uh, we will hit open and then we will hit next. Uh, next. And here you can see we have our uh, uh, project created. So just click, double click on it. This is the main .cpp file that is created for our project. This is the Hello World program that we also created in the previous lectures. And if you want to run this, just click here and it will be compiled and executed all together. Right, so here you can see this is the console and here you can see your Hello World as an output, right? So that's how you can use a code blocks IDE uh, if you want to work with C or C++ programming language.